Roundtable Radio, world famous. Hi, I'm Eric Santa Maria, the original MILF hunter, back on the air for blogtalkradio.com. We're also simulcast on Go Fight Live. Go Fight Live, hopefully there's no feed problems there and you're listening to us fine, but we are on both, and you can embed us on your blog or website if you get the embed code on our Blog Talk Radio account. So the number to call is 347-857-4647 to share your thoughts, opinions, and questions. And I'm sure you've got plenty because there's lots to talk about, especially with everything that's going on in the past couple days in WWE. But we will be getting to that a little later. I'm not going to do, I don't believe, the guest call-in for this week, and that's no reflection on Ryan from Massachusetts, who last time we were on did a great job. And I think we'll do it again, but I'm expecting a guest to call in a little later And I also want to give everyone a chance to voice their opinions since there's lots to cover. So before I introduce the panel, I want to give you some updates on some of the latest from Wrestling Roundtable. Firstly, on WrestlingRoundtable.com, Anthony Amon has been writing like a madman. Lots of recaps. He's done King of the Ring 98, SummerSlam 98, then backtracking to WCW 96 with Starcade 96, and March 26th. 1996 edition of Nitro. The significance of that, it was the first Nitro he ever watched. And it was a good one. Just reading over his recap, I wanted to look up the Flair Giant match, and it was good. Also, we've got guest columns from Zach Fellows over in England and Alex Volpe. Also be getting a news update this week with all the big news, lots of news. Some of our latest shows that are online now, shows number 59 and 60 are available. 59, we will be doing a follow-up on first up here, because that was covering Stone Cold Steve Austin's career and the best and worst promos. We will be talking about, of course, WrestleMania 28 and the big Raw Super Show the night after once we do our follow-up. But show number 60 has a very interesting one-on-one with Jenny Rose, formerly Jamelia Kraft of Pro Wrestling Respect. She wrestled over in Japan for a little while. And she's only been wrestling a couple years, but a very eventful couple years. In those couple years, she's gone everywhere from Indies in America to Ring of Honor to Japan and back. She's back in America wrestling now and holding multiple titles. So find out more about Jenny Rose on show number 60. We've also got a lot of exclusive matches. First up from... Richie Paradise of New Era Wrestling right now in Florida. Well, this is back in his, well, he had lots of names back then. First up was his Lightning Kid persona from Fall 98 taking on Falcon, or is it the Falcon? I couldn't tell. From Pan American Wrestling. Then, in a special two-for-one deal, you go into a blindfold battle royal. What's a blindfold battle royal? Well, click and find out. There he participates as Rotten Randy Crosswell. Another exclusive match we have is Alex Payne, the American Psycho, as he takes on TJ Sykes from Real Championship Wrestling, that's RCW, in Baltimore, Maryland last year. And, of course, aside from matches, we've got a new blog. Midge met up with Gilberto in Miami for WrestleMania. Brett Midge Simonello documenting what happened in Miami in our latest blog. We don't have any new polls just yet. I didn't have time before the show to update the website with that, but expect that after the show tonight we will have new polls on WrestlingRoundTable.com. And coming up on April 29th, that's Sunday, April 29th, we will be taping our next set of shows. And I'm happy to announce that just confirmed like maybe an hour ago, Grizzly Redwood will be rejoining us for... April 29th tapings, we will be talking about The Undertaker's career. I think it's appropriate now to look back on The Dead Man's career. We'll also be talking about The Best and Worst Heels and Faces. That's going to take up an entire show. So, lots of other things coming up for Wrestling Roundtable. So, check that out now on WrestlingRoundtable.com. You can also get the links to all of our social networking sites. We've got two Facebook pages a group page and a fan page. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. If you're listening to us on YouTube, it's way after the fact. You want to listen live on blogtalkradio.com, 347-857-4647, Tuesdays at 11 p.m. And, of course, like I mentioned before, we're also on GoFi Live. Plus, 
our entire archive is available in audio slash podcast form on iTunes, also on Blog Talk Radio as well. So right now, let's introduce the panel, at least as it's made up of right now. We have the Wills on. First up, Will Effin Brooks, who is in our chat room every Monday night during Raw. And I'm sure it was pretty packed last night and crazy. Will Brooks, how are you? I'm great. I'm coming to you guys live. My first radio show here in my new place in Philadelphia. It's wonderful. And also, I know we're going to talk about Raw later, but i got to get this out of the way. It's too much to bear. We have to talk about the wonderful, triumphant return of Abraham Washington. Thank God. I, I miss the Abraham Washington show so much. But no, seriously, he'll be a great manager for Mark Henry. I can't wait to see how that plays out. The new B4W Tag Team Champion, Will TLD Fafitas. TLD is Tommy Lee Danger. He won the belt the other week, and now he is on the radio. Hey, Will. I'm still feeling very, very sore, but i got to say, though, the four minutes that I had in the ring was all well worth it. And I do appreciate you and Mitch for coming out to the show. Um, it was wonderful. Loved it, and I'm finally happy to be back, and this is just a nice booming time to talk about, about some good wrestling. Yes, and we covered that event in our latest news update. Always have the latest results, previews of what's coming up next, and some exclusive tidbits, too. You can sign up for the newsletter, which has some exclusive content from myself, in addition to the news, at WrestlingRoundTable.com. Find out the details there. News update coming this week. And now wanted to start off, like I said, with a follow-up on some of our latest shows because we like to expand on some of the things we didn't necessarily get to cover on YouTube here on the radio show. Now, of course, a lot of it is we look to you for input. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your opinion. So we encourage you to leave comments wherever it is. You can sign up for our message board at WrestlingRoundTable.com and put a thread over there. Facebook, of course. Twitter, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you can leave comments, we want to hear your thoughts and opinions, and even criticism. But for Stone Cold Steve Austin, a lot of people said that the show was good, and I was very happy. I was, as you guys know, very worried, because I'm a Hulk Hogan fan. I don't put on any front about that. I'm a Hulk Hogan fan, and I really wasn't a Stone Cold Steve Austin fan, i got to say, because I just couldn't relate to him, really. I mean, I understand why people liked him, as we talked about on the show. But for myself personally, I just don't relate to a beer-drinking redneck who kills animals. I just don't. (laughs) That's not to say I didn't like a lot of his work, because I did. But I just didn't connect with him in the same way as I did with Hulk Hogan when I was younger. And even Hollywood Hogan once he turned heel, uh, because that preceded Austin's rise to the top by about a year. And... I know in June 96, he won the King of the Ring, and that's when the Austin 316 promo happened. And retroactively, WWE would like you to think that that's the moment that Stone Cold became a star, but it really wasn't. He might have gotten a little cold following, but you'd think based on their video packages that he said, Austin 316 said, I just whipped your ass, and boom. But you look at the next pay-per-view, or actually two pay-per-views later in August, and he was wrestling on the free-for-all against Yokozuna. You go two more pay-per-views ahead at the Buried Alive pay-per-view in October, which Michaels didn't wrestle on, by the way, that I think he was originally supposed to wrestle maybe Savio Vega or someone to opener, and they got hurt, so they replaced him with someone who he'd have a lot of matches with later on, Triple H, back when he was Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Perman Proper, and it was a rare heel-heel match, too, but it was supposed to have gotten a lot of good reviews, and people thought it was surprisingly pretty good. Now, the word is that he, in his feud with Bret the Hitman Hart, which happened around this time, Bret Hart, that's the rumor, that he had to fight to get this program with Stone Cold. Like, I guess the rumor was McMahon didn't really believe in him or whatever. Sounds familiar. (laughs) But uh, Bret did wanted to work with him, was a fan of his, and the rest is fucking history, I'll say. And that's really the feud that put Stone Cold Steve Austin over. And I really want to go into detail about the Bret Austin feud because I think it's one of the most brilliant stories the WWF ever told. So before I do, I'll throw it to you guys and see if there's anything else 
that you wanted to throw in about Stone Cold Steve Austin and his career. We really didn't touch on his heel run in 2001 very much. I don't know if it's related to that, but any other further thoughts on Steve Austin and his whole wrestling career, Will Vafides? It also had a lot to do with his uh, the year after with his neck injury. He was a part of the show even though he didn't do any wrestling. So I think it had a lot to do. That's when he was starting to be like the anti-figurehead where he was not going to follow the rules of the authorities. So I think that had a lot to do with it, too. I, you know, Even though he turned a really bad situation into a really good one, I think it had a lot to do with it, too. And it was a combination of Bret Hart getting the switch over from heel to face and then challenging all the authority figures, too. Well, when he did start going against the authority figures, that's what's funny. I've touched upon it a little bit in the past few shows, but when I said that a lot of people, speaking of retroactive history and rewriting it, is a lot of people think that Mr. McMahon sprang up because of the Montreal screw job, but he really didn't. It was more like that gave them fuel to go even further with it. Really, that whole year in 97, they had already been doing the McMahon as kind of the authority figure, kind of unsaid almost, because they never acknowledged particularly every once in a while, but they never really acknowledged that he was the president or the real president, not Jack Tunney, or the owner of the WWF. But in 97, we see Bret Hart getting in that spat with Vince McMahon and after the steel cage match with Sid and uh, later on in the year when McMahon pulled up the shirt over his head like a hockey fight and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Farouk, before King of the Ring 97, taking McMahon to task about there not being a black champion, DX antagonizing McMahon before they had a name when they were just a click, showing the MSG incident with the click. So it's already being kind of made a thing that McMahon is the guy that everyone goes to because the, everyone pretty much knows he's in charge. And when Austin broke his neck, or Owen broke his neck, I should say, at SummerSlam 97, that was also one of the best Austin moments to me. Not that I wanted him to get hurt, that's awful, but the fact that he showed such guts standing up after that and walking out, even if it was with some help or whatever, just the fact that he could fucking move and go through with the rest of the plan, that showed a lot of fucking character, not even in a wrestling sense. But from there, they turned everything into the storyline to get him the fucking sympathy, because his whole thing was, I want to compete and I want to wrestle, and the authority figures were, no, for your own good, and there goes the Intercontinental title, there goes the tag title, and they're taking away everything from him under the guise of for his own health, which he didn't really believe, and then he starts stunning the announcers, he stuns Ross, he stuns Lawler, he stuns referees, he stuns the Commissioner Slaughter, and it's all building up. Well, there's only one target left, and it's the top guy at the the top of the heap, Vince McMahon, and that was all building up to the first Raw in Madison Square Garden, September 1997. That's the first time he actually stunned McMahon, so that was like a month and a half, two months, whatever, before the Montreal screw job even happened. So any other thoughts, Will Brooks, on Stone Cold's career? When the Stone Cold inducted Bret Hart in the Hall of Fame, he even mentioned that after he cut the promo, he was known, but he didn't, he wasn't doing anything until Bret Hart came back. And he acknowledged that think, without Bret Hart, I wouldn't have been anything. Another thing that people don't talk about, the same night when he cut that promo of King of Ring 96, in his match with Mark Merrill, he got busted up. Like, when Mark Merrill kicked him and, like, split up in his whole lip, it yeah. looked like fucking Joaquin Phoenix a little bit. And he had to go, like, get stitches and come back to finish the pay-per-view, which... People don't remember, like, that was, that, was, that man looked kind of badass. He went got stitches and came back to fight like a hockey player would. It was pretty cool. Yeah, they put it in Raw Magazine. Exactly. It was great. It was like, well, that's nothing people don't talk about. But back to what you were saying about the show in 2001, I fucking hated it. And I'll tell you why. Because it made no sense to begin with. Why would he join force with a venture man after all these years of feuding and join force with a triple H? Like, what? Fuck, no, I was so against it. I, I'm glad it only lasted like two months. The two-man power trip was awful. I couldn't stand it. I'm glad it did not last. It and, was and a complete was, ego fuck by Triple H, too. It was, because, I mean, that was, the beginning, that was the beginning when we started seeing Triple H getting his way all the time. It was the beginning of that whole shitstorm happening. They kind of got me out of wrestling for a while, too. But. Yeah, and I, I know you stopped watching, and you and a lot of other people. So let me fill in the blanks there for you, because with the two-man power trip, it was, when I say it was an ego fuck, it clearly was, because these two just had, and it's still revered to this day, 
Although I do like their No Mercy 99 title match, too. That's forgotten. But the three stages of Hell match at No Way Out 2001, which people still love to this day, this was the culmination of multiple attempted murders by both guys. <laughs> like, Austin came back at Survivor Series 2000 and dropped Triple H off a fucking crane while in a car. And then Triple H was the one who paid off for Kishi to run over Austin and all this other shit that they were doing. And then all of a sudden, two months later, after not interacting with each other, they're all buddy-buddy and going to take over the whole company by both getting every title. It was absurd. I think it was just... I don't want to say bad timing, but that's just coincidentally really how it happened that they bought WCW around that time. They didn't really know what to do with it. They had multiple stops and starts behind the scenes, and then eventually it centered around Austin, but that's getting ahead of myself a little bit. Now, when I say that the heel turn bombed, sorry smart marks on the internet who liked it, it's a cult hit. And parts of it, yeah, were enjoyable in a certain way, but looking at the numbers, it didn't fucking work. The ratings went down after WrestleMania 17 a little bit every week for, I think, several months. And you look at the pay-per-view buys, outside of Invasion, which did great, it was shit. Now, when you turn Austin Heel in Texas in the main event of WrestleMania, all right, whatever. That that was just dumb, too. But there was no explanation. There was no really no reason. If they had just come out and said that Austin was so paranoid about losing the title or getting the title or keeping the title that he would even at this point side with his mortal enemy Vince McMahon it would have been a lot better but instead he just came out and said you want a reason well I'm gonna tell you well what the fuck is that shit and then a couple months later when the invasion really starts getting going Booker T hurts fucking Austin at King of the Ring 2001 and the whole Jericho Ben he who we do not speak of thing kind of goes to the wayside well Austin's already a heel, but then the WCW invasion becomes the bigger heels. So then Vince McMahon begs Austin to come back. And I'm sure you all remember Raw before invasion where Austin was at a bar and they're begging Austin to come back and he's contemplating it, contemplating it. And then he shows up in his pickup, beats up the whole alliance by himself, which was silly. Kind of like how he beat up the whole NWO by himself the next year, which was also ridiculous. Yeah, the NWO can beat up two whole factions of, like, the Horsemen, the Dungeon of Doom, and other WCW wrestlers. Three guys all by themselves, but they can't beat up Austin. So anyway, Austin beats up WCW. And then six days later, joins WCW. Which, of course, is dumb, because that's the whole reason his character exists, because he was pissed off about getting fired from WCW. So, of course, why would he go back? But it's not like they pay attention to that history anyway. I just thought it was dumb that he would beat up all these guys, what, just to swerve the WWF? Then, of course, he beats up WCW through the whole match, but right at the end, then he joins. And then this turns into some weird... I mean, if you thought NWO Hollywood was bad... It turns into this whole weird Austin worship thing, and, like, everybody's worshiping Austin, and the whole invasion centers around him, or what became the Alliance at this point. Yeah, I like some of the paranoid what stuff that would come out eventually, but turning Austin twice in one year, and in such weird circumstances, like, what, he joined the Alliance because Vince was giving Kurt Angle more hugs than him? Weak as shit. And you could tell that at some point they just threw in the towel and considered a failure because the day after Survivor Series 2001, when the Alliance had the final loss, then all of a sudden Austin's a face again, Kurt Angle's a heel again, and they just pretend that never happened. So I think that was clearly throwing in the towel. But I certainly concede he was one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, biggest names of all time. But I think I did raise some valid points about him getting a free pass on everything, whether it's burying Lance Storm and sucking the heat away from everyone he was involved with when he was the sheriff. Not that he didn't help make some guys, sure, but I think people overlook a lot of stuff. Like, why is it that any time Austin refuses to work with somebody like The Rock or Billy Gunn or Jeff Jarrett, it's always justified. If Hogan refuses to lay down to somebody or if Triple H refuses to lay down to everybody in 2003, then all of a sudden they're vilified. But when Austin doesn't want a job to Lesnar, oh, no, no, it makes sense. His reasoning made sense. It should have been built up, not a throwaway match on Raw and the King of the Ring or whatever. But you know what? Why is it good for the goose and not for the gander? If Austin's given orders from the boss 
and he doesn't want to do it and takes his ball and goes home, I don't know. I just I think he gets a free pass on a lot of things. But like I said, it doesn't take away from his legacy at all, and that's really what I wanted to get to because it was really interesting and telling in a way when I threw it to you guys and said best moments and the first things were comedy, <laughs> which – I just felt very weird about, at least in my opinion, it wasn't even the best Austin comedy. If you want to go to best Austin comedy, I think the uh, confessional with Booker T was funnier than the supermarket. The supermarket thing was, I I didn't like it because, yeah, it was kind of funny, but it was kind of stupid that Booker couldn't even get in, like, what, any offense in a supermarket? And that was really the blow-off to their feud. It wasn't even in a match. Kind of like how DDP wasn't even good enough for a, a match at King of the Ring with Undertaker. It was a confrontation, which he got beat up in and ran away. But uh, I wanted to mention this to you, Will Vafides, because you asked about the supermarket. We got a message on YouTube from Josh Ortiz88, who's been a longtime viewer. He said that segment was filmed here in Bakersfield, California in 2001 when they were taping SmackDown at the Rabobank Arena. I had a few friends attend that taping. It was during my eighth grade year. The supermarket is called Green Frog Market. My aunt lives in the vicinity of it. About a year ago, I was living with her, and I would frequently shop there. I never had the nerve to ask the manager how and why they let them film a brawl here. But uh, it's the Green Frog Supermarket, so if you're interested, you've got some more information on it. So I know. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, some of the messages we get sometimes. But... I know for myself, I mean, I mentioned some things, but for Austin moments, like I'm thinking Mike Tyson on Raw. That was perfect. I mean, the world is watching, and it, well, at least was watching after the fact. And Austin was perfect in his role. There was just chaos. It, it looked real. People thought that Austin was going to fight Tyson at WrestleMania. And, and then, of course, McMahon was just great at the end. You ruined it. You ruined it like this was his big moment, and you ruined it. And the Pillman gun incident. I know that's kind of, like, looked down upon because of the gun, but that really made Austin seem like a fucking psycho menace. Pillman was one himself, but, of course, he was uh, beat up by Stone Cold with the cane, so he's hobbled up in his house, and Austin's stalking him outside, and building up through the rest of the night, I thought it was really uh, dramatic. And, of course attacking Bret Hart in the ambulance after he had already stomped Bret Hart and put him out and he's being carted away in the ambulance. And this is like, uh, April 97 or so. And he's in the ambulance waiting for Bret Hart. And you didn't see that because of the way they filmed it. And then you find out Austin's beating Bret up in the ambulance. I also love the, uh, not the Mr. Sacco portion here, but when Austin was dressed up as the doctor and beat up McMahon in the hospital, which was, I think, a week after the Zamboni incident I did talk about. And that was just a, a good Austin moment. So do you have any others you wanted to throw along, Will Vafides? A lot of them are comedy in a way, like the Zamboni, the car. I even Because a lot of it's like over the, the top. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's over the top. It's like all the stuff we know. Like, if you watch the Austin DVD, which I hope everyone gets. Through our that's Amazon I, store. Yeah, through your Amazon store, absolutely, because that's where I got mine. <laughs> There's so many awesome moments. There's so many to count. Like, I can't even count, like, how many Hulk Hogan moments that, are, like, just stand out to me like that, like how many they have. There's so many to pick from. Even the Lance Storm thing, I, you frown on it. I actually thought it was funny. Well, of course, I think the because whole, no one, I, the people who say it was funny didn't see Lance Storm in WCW, and I know no one watched it in the no, last year. No, I watched him. I watched him winning all the championships with the Canadian. I did watch him. Was he boring? In a way, he was. In a way, he was. He was kind of boring as far as his character, but that's who he was anyway. And I thought all the Eric Bischoff stuff was one of the one of the greatest times, like when the general manager actually meant something where. You saw the struggle between two guys. I was really mad when they ended that early. That whole series with him and Bischoff going back and forth, and that he could no one could touch Austin. I thought that was a good storyline too. Actually, I I think for all the real life bad blood there, I thought the Austin Bischoff stuff fell kind of flat to me. And I don't know if it's because they had already done Austin and the authority figure with McMahon and done it so well before that, but I, I just wasn't feeling that one. Yeah, I guess we have different opinions, but I think that. He did a good job at that role. I thought that was good. Also, he was a part of the McMahon shaving him bald. I mean, that was also a moment, too. I like the one, um, he, the one, well, he wore a suit, 
and he even wore like the Stone Cold hat, like and like he was posing with Mick McMahon, and then he, but after he posted with McMahon, he smiled and was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna take all this shit off." And then he just gave McMahon like the best tip I've ever seen in my life. It was hilarious. He just like punched and went to the ball, went in front of the whole crowd. But like even like the night where Dude Love debuted and he was tag Stone Cold tag team partner against Owen Hart's Great Bulldogs. <laughs> you know, and what's funny about that, how like how bad tag team wrestling is in WWE right now, is that even in that match, even though Stone Cold had not been in a tag team, just part of the Hollywood Blondes, he still had enough enough wherewithal to remember that when he tagged uh, Dude Love in, he still like set him up for a move. No one does that anymore. Like cause nowadays, you tag a guy in and that like, guy just takes over it. Like back then, you tag a guy in, you you held him back or you held him down or you put an arm out so the guy would do something to you. Know? Little things. Yeah, it's little things. And it's funny, like, even as a guy who's entrenched in being a singles wrestler, I still have enough wherewithal to remember, oh, yeah, I got to do this. One of the things I loved about the Dude Love debut, too, was that reaction shot. They cut to Austin, like, what the fuck? I love that so much. I actually memorized his promo coming out to the ring. It was so funny to me. Going into World Rumble in 1998, how he was just attacking everybody and stunning everybody to the point where when he, his, number, his number came up, everybody in the ring stopped wrestling and was waiting for him because he didn't want to get revenge on him. And what did he do? He came through the crowd and eliminated two guys before anybody knew what the hell was going on. Good stuff. Good stuff all around. Well, for matches, I just wanted to, and we'll move on in a moment, but I just wanted to throw in at least a couple more because he had a lot of matches with Undertaker, and I think if he had his way, he'd wrestled the Undertaker the rest of his life. Clearly not Hogan, because I think every time they've tried setting that up, Austin's been the one who's killed that, but that's another issue. Austin and Undertaker, though, had a lot of matches. I know a lot of people think SummerSlam 98, the Highway to Hell, under-delivered. I thought it was a good match. But they also had a good one. Austin's, I think, first title match on pay-per-view was In Your House, A Cold Day in Hell. That was Austin and Undertaker. So even before neck surgery, he was wrestling Undertaker. Good match. He was involved in a lot of good matches with other people in the WWF, like the Canadian Stampede 10-man tag, the Final Four or Fatal Four way, whatever they called the February 97 pay-per-view that was Elimination with Vader, Undertaker, and Brett, which rumor was he was supposed to win but got hurt, but whatever. And also the six-pack Hell in a Cell from December 2000. He was That was really like all the big names – Plus Rikishi. So even though Rikishi stood out, it was still a good match. And Shawn Michaels and he had a match at King of the Ring 97 way before the WrestleMania 14 match, which I would have said, but I think that match was more the story of Michaels getting through it, uh, at least till the bell rang, and then it was all Austin. The Austin era has begun and whatever, so that's great passing the torch to Austin, but uh, the better match technically, I guess, would be King of the Ring 97 when Michaels was originally supposed to face Bret Hart, and I think Austin was originally supposed to face Brian Pillman, so neither of those happened. They cut half that match out and had Austin Shawn Michaels the first time, at least on uh, pay-per-view. And, of course, the two matches with Dude Love after WrestleMania 14, those were pretty good. Unforgiven kind of set up the second one, but it was a good brawl in and of itself. But the over-the-edge match from 1998, May 98, was the real template for a lot of copycats to follow because there were so many great McMahon changing the rules on the fly with the Stooges and then Austin counting down the pinfall on Dude Love with McMahon's own hand, and that was just really great. So let's see what some of you guys think about anything, really. We're going to talk about promos in a moment, but we've got a lot of you on the line, so I want to get to some of you. Abe in Augusta, Georgia, on the line. Well, you just discussed the Austin thing. Um, one match that I thought was really good, but not, that don't get talked about a lot, you know The Rock? Um, Austin series in '99, I think it was. They had a better match at Backlash that year. The month That's what a lot of people think, and I tend to agree. I think WrestleMania 15 was okay, but nothing that spectacular. And I actually wouldn't even rank it among the matches that they did have because, yeah, the Backlash match, see, the next month, the rematch seemed to have a little more oomph to it. Maybe it's the neck or something. I don't know. But they also had another match, 2001. It was during the invasion invasion thing, but it was um the I think it was you know, November UK pay per view rebellion. They mm-hmm. had a very good match um in the UK for the WF title that don't get talked about, but it's rare to have to find and watch it. My favorite Austin awesome moment was in this. You may remember this. It was on Livewire where they kept branding on people <laughs> where they're doing live calling and stuff. 
he said about mosquitoes, I'm I'm not wiping off bit 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 by the day and all that kind of stuff. In other words, he I think you I know I don't know what show it was, but he beat everyone to see it and tore down all the TVs and stuff. That was ridiculously funny. Yeah, that was like the first glimpses of the chaos that Stone Cold would reign and I'm sure we'll get back to you later on, Abe. You're one of the guys that stick through the whole show, so thank you very much for doing so. We've got 734 area code. Name and location, please. This is Eugene calling from Detroit. Hey, Eugene in Detroit. You're on Wrestling Roundtable, so what do you got to say? Everybody wants to say that um, the Austin era started at King Ring. I, I'm like you. I don't agree that it started at King Ring. I think it started later, but my thing with Austin was when him and Angle would, I don't know how to explain it, but him and Angle, the comedy between him and Angle, because I actually find it funny to watch Austin try and do comedy because I don't think Austin was a, you know, a funny man from the get-go. So I always felt that my version of the Austin era started once, like, right around the time where he was going with the Alliance and before he turned back, I don't know, like I said, most people don't like that they're like that point of Austin's career, but I kind of do. Is this Eugene Chandler? Yes, this is. Hey, I thought I recognized you from Facebook. Hey. Yes, I finally, I finally made it. I finally called. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's uh, great to hear some familiar faces on our Facebook group finally calling in the Brett Austin thing. What I wanted to say about that was I was thinking the other day about the Pillman little thing that they had because. Really, if you think about it, when he beat up Brian Pillman, which I believe was in around September 96, I think it might have aired on Superstars, but Pillman was doing interviews at the time because he was fucked up. He had a car wreck and couldn't wrestle, so he was hobbling around and doing interviews and doing other little things, commentary, and just being around. And Brett wasn't back yet, so... There was still that will Brett come back thing going on after WrestleMania 12, and this has been going on for a while. And that's when you get the famous, you're putting Ness in front of Hitman, and that's my opinion on Bret Hart, and, which was a classic line that everybody liked. But what was really neat about this little thing is the Bret Austin feud, which the seeds were planted there, went all the way through pretty much to the next year, if you want to count it branching into the Owen feud. It involved so many other people. And what was interesting about Pillman in particular was, I, we all know about the Hollywood Blondes, so when Pillman's interviewing Austin, it's kind of like a wink-wink, nudge-nudge, and when Austin is making a point, like, Pillman didn't deliver Bret Hart like he had promised or something. So Austin takes it out on Pillman, Pillmanizes his ankle, beats the shit out of his already hurt, crippled friend, just to show, like, how heartless and cruel this guy is. Well, that eventually leads into like a little mini feud with Brian Pillman, as I alluded to King of the Ring 97 before. Well, couldn't that, in a sense, really factor into the Hard Foundation feud in the sense that you think like, well, his former friend beats the shit out of him. He goes back to his roots. He goes back to the dungeon, all leading up to the Canadian Stampede match. And, of course, that started the Owen feud, too. I do have to backtrack a little bit for WrestleMania 13 because that was really... One of the best matches and stories all woven together in WF history where the double turn, right? Well, Austin refuses to give up. He's he's already in a bad position. And Bret Hart, he's gone through months of dealing with this coyote, as he called him. And he got screwed at the Rumble 97. He got screwed out of the title the day after Fatal 4-Way, losing it to Sid, the first world title change on Raw, by the way. And he's been screwed by Austin after already out-wrestling him in Madison Square Garden in his comeback match. So Austin keeps being a thorn in his side, and he drags Bret Hart down to his level to this I Quit brawl with chairs and cables wrapped around Bret's neck and brawls through the crowd. Austin brings down Bret to his level. Then Bret gets him in a vulnerable position. He outdoes Austin on his own terms and has him right where he wants him, right in the middle of the ring, in his submission, and Austin still refuses to give up. And that's what really won over the fans. And what was so brilliant about it, too, is after the fact, after the referee Ken Shamrock stops the match, Bret Hart does something the old Bret Hart would never do. He starts kicking a man when he's down. Not only when he's down, when he's unconscious and bloody and beaten. 
what? You people are booing me? Well, fuck you. And he just goes at it to the point where the MMA fighter had to keep him off of Austin, leading, of course, into the Hart Foundation. And it's also funny how, like, you could get a little sense of Brett was kind of reuniting them, Owen and Bulldog, with himself selfishly because, like, well, all my friends in America turned their back on me. I'm going to bring my family back and surround myself with people who understand and respect me. And those are all heels. So he's bringing the heels together and being a heel himself, bringing back Jim Neidhart, so the continuity there. Just really one of the most brilliant angles the WF ever did. And I just wanted to elaborate on that a little more. So let's go to one other call before we get to the promos. Justin in Eagle, Wisconsin, you are on. Don't really have much to comment on the Austin era. I was largely absent during that. I only caught like a snippet here and there. Did you start watching and stop and come back, or did you start watching after that? I was like like one level below casual fan. It's like if it was on, cool, I'd watch it, but I wouldn't really revolve my schedule around it. Didn't really become a big fan until like 06. What made you become a fan in 06? Because that's coincidentally when I stopped watching. I was taken to a WWE show for my birthday, and I thought, oh, this is so cool. Hmm. But like, it started getting lame in like 07, late 07. <laughs> the second follow up was on the second half of show 59, and that was the best and worst promos. There weren't a lot of examples for worst frankly, because there were so many you could think of for best. But just wanted to throw some others out there. Roderick Strong, oh, always, <laughs> he gets fed a couple one-liners here and there that are good, like on the Sinclair show where building up the final battle if Davey and Eddie, because he was so upset about not being in the main event himself, but these guys are, where Davey and Eddie had their rematch in New York, if this isn't the best match I've ever seen, I'm going to kick everyone in the balls, that sort of thing. That was good, but generally not very good. And if there's any ROH fans out there, I don't remember which show it was exactly because it was one of the matches when Danielson was the champion in Chicago with Roderick, and he was trying to cut a promo after the match of like five more minutes or bringing Danielson back, and he fucked up so bad that he actually apologized. So if you remember that one, uh, feel free to comment on it, maybe in the chat room or post it somewhere or go right ahead. Uh, Yokozuna as a face, and I know he just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. He's one of my favorite of all time, but there's just some guys who shouldn't talk, and not even necessarily because they're bad at it, just because it really takes away from their character. Uh, Sabu would definitely be one of them, for my opinion, but Yokozuna, when he turned face, I know a lot of people were shocked that he spoke English, (laughs) Uh, even though he's in reality, like uh, an American Samoan from San Francisco. But all the same, I did not like any of his face promos. I did not like hearing him talk. And, of course, people brought up Rikishi's I Did It For The Rock promo, one of the most infamous bad moments in wrestling history, so that's certainly one to bring up. But guys like Randy Orton and Edge, I'm sorry, they just don't do it for me. They don't seem authentic, or they're just boring. (laughs) I just never really cared for any time they talked. But last one I'll throw out there is a lot of late ECW, like I'm talking like 2000 time frame, Simon Diamond never did it for me. I never cared for any of his promos. And when you need to do stuff like the clap for Scotty Riggs to get them over because they're so boring, making stupid sex jokes, I just didn't really care for that shit at all. So do you guys have any others you wanted to throw out there for some examples of who or what were some of the worst promos, Will Brooks? Actually, I have one for the best one, which is something I'm actually kind of mad we never brought up for that show or the Shawn Michaels review show. Uh, For the press conference going into WrestleMania 11, Shawn Michaels did say something I thought was so cool. uh, I never forgot it. I will put on a show like you have never, ever seen before. Why? Because, because I, I can. can. I was like, oh, shit, that was so cool. I hated Shawn Michaels time. I'm like, man, I gotta, that's awesome. <laughs> that was a really great line. One thing I really didn't like that we didn't bring up was the introduction of the new blood and taking all the belts back. I don't know if that's like a promo, but it was like when they were trying to reset the entire company around. It was April 10th, was- 2000 on Nitro. Yeah, that was one of the worst things that they could have ever done. It was like trying to do a reset of the whole company 
basically it's like stripping a guy of a belt, but he didn't do anything wrong to, to get it stripped. It's like the weirdest thing they did, and I, I never understood that. I understand what they're trying to do. Bischoff was joining Russo. It just didn't make any sense. I'm not saying it was the greatest thing ever, but I don't think it was the worst thing they even did that year. <laughs> Some of the best. Holy shit, where do we even begin? Because there's guys that we didn't even get to. Obviously, Jake the Snake would be on there, but Ravishing Rick Rude. Oh, my God. Every promo about cut the music. All you fat, out of shape, real man looks like blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was essentially the same format, but he would just change it up every time. And I loved it every time. But, of course, Ted DiBiase selling all his great lines of greed and all that sort of stuff with his infamous laugh just great but uh i would defend sid here because i know sid was like the first one brought up for bad and of course he's got all of his famous wrestle crap botchamania whatever the fuck you want to say moments like i have half a brain you do yeah yeah the one people don't remember was when he was with macho man as his bodyguard when it was what up Mach in 99 and he said this mind's man this man's mind excuse me he actually said, excuse me, live on Nitro, so I thought that was funny, but that doesn't get as much play as the other one. But I would defend Sid here because I really think that in a lot of his at least early stuff, he seemed legitimately menacing. This guy looks like a Greek god. He's jacked, he's muscular with curly blonde hair, giant guy, and he sold you on the fact that he was a fucking maniac, that he could do anything at any time. Maybe it's tape, Sid, like I said, but I think he really got that across in some of his promos. If you think back to when they announced Hulk Hogan was the number one contender and all these other guys weren't for Ric Flair's title, and they cut right to Sid for that reaction shot. And then there was this big promo afterwards about you really think Hulk Hogan is more worthy than me and blah, 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 or screaming at Mean Gene at WrestleMania 8, shut up, you fat little oaf, and all these great things that he got his heel persona across with. And if nothing else, Will Vafides, I, I think it's more a skit than a promo necessarily with the Shockmaster thing, but you have to give Sid credit at least because him and Harlem Heat were doing their best to try and sell that shit. Right. Oh, cool. I, why do we even talk about it? I, I, we have to see it. I, if you see Are You Serious it's from WWE's YouTube channel, you can pretty much see all the worst promos they ever did. I mean, and that's, that's why I think that shows fun. bullshit, because that segment on the barber shop was awesome. I don't care if they just happened to notice him getting hit in the face for a little bit. That segment was great. But when it was mentioned, the Bash at the Beach 96 promo with Hulk Hogan, and how it was very important for that promo to hit every note, because there was a lot writing on it. This was a very important moment. There's a few others like that. I think of Shane Douglas when ECW Eastern Championship Wrestling became extreme, screwing over Howard Brody and the NWA in the finals of that tournament when he threw down the belt. That's another promo that will like live for a long time. I don't know, maybe forever, but that was another promo that set everything up so perfectly, mentioning the history of the NWA and all the guys that have it, and they can all kiss my ass. And that ushered in the era of extreme. They put essentially all their eggs in their basket with Shane Douglas for a reason. So I think that's another one. And Pat G in the chat room mentioning Booker T's, Hulk Hogan, we cover for you. That, that is probably my favorite line in wrestling history. What about the, uh, when the four horsemen we formed with Ric Flair coming back? Fire me. Hey, I'm already fired. Exactly. I thought that was good. Absolutely. Yeah. Another, Very good. It's funny how a lot of these – pivotal moments are coming outside of WWE. Like Scott Hall's when he, it's not a debut, he was in WCW before. When he returned to WCW on Nitro in 96 in the middle of that fucking jobber match and set the tone for what this invasion would be immediately. How perfectly was that? Him doing essentially the Razor Ramon Scarface accent. And then using all the terms the WWF used to make fun of WCW with Billionaire Ted and the Nacho Man. Perfect. Along those lines, I would even say when X-Pac returned to the WWF, the day after WrestleMania 14. Because, I mean, if you listen to any interviews, we all know Sean Waltman actually respects Hulk Hogan and likes the guy. But we didn't know that then. And when Triple H sets it up perfectly with, Sean, you dropped the ball – and you look towards your friends, you look towards the click, 
and Sean Waldman comes out as X Pac. We didn't, I don't think, knew that his name was going to be X-Pac yet. But he cut that promo, suck it, WCW, and Hulk Hogan, blah, blah, blah. That was just perfect. One of the funniest things that I liked to watch was, and recently was, when The Rock came back and he did the skit with the history lessons. I thought those were pretty damn funny, especially when the first one where he was throwing uh, his stuff into the river, like the Boston Tea Party. That was pretty damn funny. I, I, that, at least to me, for more recent stuff, that I prefer the funny. Benjamin Franklin one myself. Yeah, well, they were, they were all good. I mean, so I thought they were great. Even the rock concert was really great because that was definitely pushing some stuff. It's really good. With Dusty Rhodes, from I've been eating beans and king and queens and all that stuff, uh, the common man stuff, but Hard Times is one that was brought up, and that was a really good one because I'll compare it and contrast to a few later on that Flair had, but with Dusty's common man to Ric Flair's bourgeois rich jack-off thing, it really helped sell the idea that Dusty Rhodes knows what the common man feels like. Dusty Rhodes feels your pain and represents you. And it's funny because later on, a couple of years later, when Ric Flair was feeding with Ricky Steamboat, that's not what happened at all. There were a lot of promos building up to, and they did have – three matches, big matches that year, but the third one, people were cheering Ric Flair. <laughs> they didn't like Ricky Steamboat's common man. I'm just a humble guy with a wife and kid, and I'm just going to do my best. People were like, fuck that. You think ECW were the first smart marks? You were wrong, <laughs> because people were totally into Ric Flair with his fur coats and women and limos and Lear jets and rings and all that other sort of glamour stuff. It was really interesting, and of course, Ric Flair himself is one of the best of all time, and he had so many great ones from Royal Rumble 92 when he won the title with a tear in my eye, even though he was a heel, selling how important this title and this win was to him, to even the last Nitro, even though we hear in retrospect when he's talking about WCW at the end, oh, I was glad it was dead, I hated it, and blah, 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 but you know what? That promo he cut on the last Nitro about Vince McMahon ain't going to shut us down, we're WCW, we're the greatest, and tonight we're going to go out the greatest, me and Sting, that was really awesome. It really sold the emotion for that night, at least for WCW fans. I also love Sergeant Slaughter's heel stuff in 91, in 1990, he, with that voice, that sounds like a heel's voice, doesn't it? And all his great lines about Saddam Hussein and the ultimate puke and the immortal slime. He really sold how much of an asshole he was. I really love that. Speaking of Ric Flair, back in 03 when Ric Flair faced Triple H in, um, on Raw, uh, Triple H expecting Ric Flair just to lay down and then pin him one, one, two, three. Ric Flair, it was in South Carolina. Ric said, fuck that. You had a tough match. I've had a thousand tough matches, and I never said I couldn't wrestle. It was great promos. All of lead up to the match. The match was okay for a raw match, but I'm actually, you know, I've been, I was watching it last night. There was great leading promos going up to the match later that night in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's funny you say that because Flair and Triple H had another one. I think it was September 2nd, 2002, when Bischoff brought back the big gold belt when they split it off from the undisputed title and handed it to fucking Triple H. And, well, how do we sell the legitimacy of this title being handed to somebody? And they bring out Ric Flair. And he was like, I never had a belt handed to me. <laughs> that was really great, and I want that belt back. And he, of course, jobbed to Triple H later in that night to legitimize it. But that was a really good thing that they used. Who on the roster could sell this? And it was Ric Flair. But Mick Foley's had a, a lot of great ones. We talked about Kane Dewey and the anti-hardcore stuff in ECW in the sit-down interview with Jim Ross on Raw where he talked about his childhood and his background and that's King of the Death match and that sort of stuff. But he had a great one the day after WrestleMania 14 also. We talked about the dude love matches with Austin earlier. Well, this set this up because... I'm sorry, it wasn't the day after WrestleMania 14. It was the week after because the day after he and Terry Funk got their ass beat by DX and lost the tag belts to the Outlaws. And the week later... Mick Foley cut that great promo in a neck brace, sitting in a chair at the beginning of Raw, and saying, you cheered for someone else when we were putting our necks on the line, when Terry Funk was there and you didn't even acknowledge him, and he was disgusted, and then he became corporate dude love. It was a really great setup. 
uh, uh, Vince McMahon has had so many lines himself. Um, I think clearly the day after Survivor Series 97, when a lot of people were tuning into Raw to see what the fuck happened, that Brett screwed Brett thing, uh, it seemed a lot more in character than you would think. But it definitely set the tone for Vince McMahon and all the great things that he did with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And my favorite line was, I believe, the Raw before Judgment Day 98, when Austin was being forced to be the ref, when Vince, from the safety of his wheelchair behind uh, the, the plate glass, said, I've got balls the size of grapefruits, and this Sunday, Austin, you're going to have seeds in your teeth, or whatever the fuck he said. That was great. Uh, a lot of people brought up Raven, and a lot of his promos over the years. I'd love to mention the cat because I love the cat's whole routine at the beginning of my hands and feet are registered weapons. I have to tell you this by law. I'm giving you 10 seconds to leave the ring or I'm not going to be responsible. And all the great things he did with the James Brown and Muhammad Ali combinations. I really love that stuff. Nick Bockwinkle was another name that came up on the YouTube comments because it's funny how we talked about managers on the show. Well, they put Bobby Heenan, who can talk to and has had so many lines and zingers over the years, with Nick Bockwinkle, who has a very distinct, educated, eloquent speaking style. And he had a lot of interesting promos, too. Rick Martel, I loved his French-Canadian accent when he was doing the model sort of stuff. Some people brought up Bubba Ray Dudley and all the riotous sort of stuff that he would uh, start in ECW. And we could see that even today, that they were trying to get him to turn the fans on him and bound for glory. You may remember, Will, when they played that promo for the live audience and how he made money off all you scumbags for years. Yeah, I remember that. Undertakers, there's two. I like to call them soliloquies because they seemed more like soliloquies than promos to me. But I actually like when they had that video on the screen before it was called Titan Tron at the Rumble 94 when he was thrown in the casket and we see this camera angle looking down bird's eye view on the casket and the eternal flame of life that cannot be distinguished and I will not rest in peace I thought that was really cool and the promo after Paul Bear revealed that he had a brother named Kane this is long before Kane debuted you may remember it was low lighting like almost dark lighting blue light Undertaker talking in the locker room and he almost talked through the whole thing in one camera shot telling the whole backstory of the funeral parlor and how King got burned and all that other sort of stuff, almost all one shot. I thought that was pretty cool. The first real shoot promo, work shoot, that I can remember would be, I guess, the Brian Pillman Smart Marks promo in ECW. That really set the tone for a lot of what would follow and in the WWF, too. And I thought that was probably the best one. Jerry the King Lawler, man, he used to be really great with this sort of stuff because... I remember just recently I was watching uh, King's Court before Nikolai Volkov. I think it was like the week before Nikolai Volkov joined the Million Dollar Corporation because he had to, because he needed the money. Jerry Lawler burying Nikolai Volkov to his face and just reaming him, ripping him apart. It's funny watching it back because Lawler was just doing his part as a heel. All the heels stuck together and always were rallying against the baby faces. So it was really setting up an angle with DiBiase, but after that promo, I was like, I want to see a lower Nikolai match now. He did such a great job. I really wasn't kidding when I talked about Jericho and WCW being my preference, because I know a lot of people like his WWF stuff, but so many parts of WCW I loved between the 1,004 holds thing and mispronouncing guys' names wrong all the time, Jojo Dillon, Ron Mysterio, Stinko Malenko. He had so many great promos and lines in WCW. I really liked his WCW stuff. So let's go to you guys and see if you have anything else to add to that. 859 area code. You are on roundtable. Name and location, please. Hey, this is Daniel from Lexington, Kentucky. You were talking about, like, shoe promos. One of them I thought was hilarious, or I think at the time was, probably I think it was February of 97 when Bret Hart, it was after the cage match, 
And yes. Push, Mc, Push McMahon, he's like, if you don't like it, tough shit. That I, actually came up on the YouTube video and in, in the comment yeah. section. And uh, what was the, supposedly the story about that was that he didn't know that they were airing. <laughs> he thought that was supposed to be a dark uh, segment, like that wasn't going to make air. But I'm sure that everyone who was watching that back in 97 was as blown away as I was flipping back and forth between Nitro, and I turned on Raw to hear that. I was like, what? Especially coming from Bret Hart, of all people? Yeah. And then you talk about how tape Sid's better than live Sid. If you, like, hear very closely Sid coming down the aisle and go, I don't know shit, crybaby. <laughs> he had so many great lines. I, I felt I had to stick with Sid a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty good. The one you guys are talking about, like, this is probably, like, best. Hogan's had one, like... Just talking about how he's just going to you know, ride his Harley and like it was about like SummerSlam I think it was the first SummerSlam him and Beefcake or was that the second SummerSlam him and Beefcake versus Zeus and Macho yes, Man. Yes, this was the one where Beefcake ripped off fucking Running Man. The blade is a part of me. I'll be a part of you. I didn't talk like that, but Hogan was talking about how he's going to take his Harley and just drive up and just I it's. I mean, Hogan ones that you just can't understand. And The Undertaker's and his ministry stuff was weird. But the best one's probably when he crucified Austin. I don't know if that's a promo per se. Yeah, Undertaker's stuff got a little weird. I, I like the death chant stuff that was supposed to be Egyptian but sounded like Hava Megillah to me. <laughs> but uh, thanks a lot for that All input, right. Daniel. Anthony in the Bronx, hey yo. Hey yo, what's going on, eh? Too much, too much. We're already into the second hour. We haven't even gotten to WrestleMania yet, but that's up next on the agenda. So what do you got to say? My favorite three work promos, I don't know if they were exactly like work shoots or whatever, were Paul Heyman in 2001, right yeah. before Survivor Series, mm-hmm. Joey Styles in 06. And notice how these are both like ECW guys. Well, yeah, they um, allow them to say a lot of their real feelings in it for the use of the storyline. And, I mean, how many other people, especially at the time, more like especially at the time with Heyman's in November, that was the pre-Survivor Series 2001 SmackDown, I believe. How many other yeah. people are mentioning fucking Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, and Shawn Michaels exactly. to get heat on Vince McMahon? <laughs> they even brought up Doink the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> And I love when all oh, Joey Styles was like just shooting at Jerry Lawler and the whole company. Mm-hmm. I guess that was the launching pad to bring back the watered down version of ECW. Yeah, well, as real as a Don't lot know of what feelings, happened with that. Yeah, and as <laughs> as real as a lot of those feelings are, uh, they're essentially at the end of the day used for storyline purposes because even though they feel that way, it didn't make a lot of a difference in the overall scheme of the company, did it, unfortunately. But Royce in Pomona, California, you were on. A person about promos I'm surprised you didn't mention was um, Bob Backlund after he turned heel. Ah, uh, yes. I'm going to save the society from guys like Bret Hart and Diesel, and I'm giving you people a sports education. Like, that just was so clever, and just this, this whole shtick, this whole angry old man stuff was just, like, great, and I'm surprised. And you kind of wish, like, you would have, you, they probably would have done that a little later, especially, like, in the more Attitude Era, when things were really different compared to, like, his old guys. Like, I think it would have really been a little bit better. I actually disagree with you there, because I think it probably would have gotten lost in the mix, and he would have been more of a sideshow comedy act. I mean, he kind of was anyway, but at least he got his way into the main event with Bret Hart. But I actually think they should have done it earlier, because if you watch earlier Bob Backlund stuff, he seems like kind of a weirdo anyway. (laughs) When he's doing the straight-up babyface monotone bullshit, I mean, I really feel that Vince McMahon Sr., put the belt on him at that time so long that he did in a way to kind of make it seem like the WWWF has credibility too because the NWA was for forever built on the backs of guys like Luthez all the way up through Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe type guys, guys with legit backgrounds as opposed to Billy Graham or Bruno San Martino as a power lifter Bob Backlund was like an NCAA wrestler or some shit so he brought, I think, some credibility to the table, but not a lot of charisma. And I know a lot of fans at the time didn't really care for Bob Backlund. Uh, I mean, it's a different time, so it's not like they uh, 
could turn on him every Raw every week or anything. But I don't think people got into him as much as they did Bruno before him or Hogan after. I think they could have uh, done that maniac shit a little sooner because it didn't seem like it was that far of a stretch from the way he actually is. Yeah, and I, and I like to say it, I do agree with you that Jericho's promos in WCW were like light years ahead of it really anything he kind of did in WWF. Maybe it's kind of a so bad it's good. But I have to say, Sid, some promos, like after, I don't know if this counts as a skit or a promo, but like after Goldberg crushed his car and he screamed to the heavens. Goldberg! <laughs> he did it like two weeks in a row. I thought that was pretty good. Oh, but, my God. Yeah. With Jericho, I always thought it was weird when he did come to the WWF and he was doing interviews saying things like, in WCW, They'd only write like 20% of what I said, and now here in WF it's like 80%. And he was saying this like it's a good thing. And I was like, well, the difference is pretty obvious to me so far. Yep. And I kind of wanted to, I would say disagree with you. I would, I would say disagree, but about the earlier comments about maybe some of the not-so-good promo guys, like how you think Edge. Because I don't think Edge is great either, but I would say he's bad. I just say he's more um, overrated. And I, I think I like to <laughs> Overrated our superstar? Yeah, <laughs> and I like to put maybe um, Punk in that same kind of category. It's like, I don't like, as a promo guy, I don't think he's bad per se. I think he delivers it probably well, but the problem is, for me, it seems like his stuff, it seems like I could say that. Like, I, if if it seems like I could say that, it doesn't seem all that great. Like, why it looks like maybe like a promo from The Rock or maybe Flair, like, they just seem so clever or so cool, like... Like, I was like, man, there's no way I would have came up with that line. But with Punk, it just seems like, eh. Could have like, gotten I, it off a message board. Yeah, like, like it seems like something I would say. Like, and not in a cool Austin way either. Like, Austin was like the everyman, but in a cool way where Punk just seems like a everyman in a kind of lame, like, really, that's all you got kind of way. And maybe that's me. Okay. Well, that's certainly a different perspective because I'm sure a lot of people would say that his promo last year, the one that made TMZ and everything uh, before Money in the Bank, would be up there with one of the greats of all time. But another I'd like to throw out there would be Goldust because in doing the Goldust character, and certainly he wasn't alone in doing it, but he has done so much with that character, and especially even at the beginning of the Goldust character. This is a kid who, or guy at the time, whatever, when he first showed up in the WF in 1990, if you watch it back now, it's hilarious because he's really just doing a Dusty Rhodes impression. He's doing an impression of his own dad, and we know he doesn't talk like that, but he's, blood is thicker than water, DiBiase. It's absurd watching it back now. Of course, he went to back to WCW in between many of his WWF runs, but Goldust was the character he always had his most success with, not Black Rain in TNA, not Dustin Rhodes in WCW, none of that shit. Goldust was it, and not just because it was a multi-layered character, very nuanced, very intricate, and unique, but as a heel, as a face, as Tourette's, whatever he, direction he took it in, he got it so over. And if nothing else, the Goldust character really helped Dustin Rhodes carve out a niche for himself and take a giant leap out of his father's shadow. So his promos had a lot to do with it. I mean, on one hand, he looks like the way he looks. On one end, they're hinting that he's gay. On the other, he's a movie buff. There was so much going on in his promos, and that was really cool. But enough about promos. We're going to get to WrestleMania and all the big stuff you want to talk about. Before we get to the WrestleMania portion, wanted to read the results of one of the latest polls because it builds up to WrestleMania. What will be the best match at WrestleMania 28? If I paid more attention, I would have included more matches. But of the matches that were offered up, 0% went to the GM tag match. Nobody thought that was going to be the best match of the night. But 2% of you thought the Divas tag match would. Really? That's very interesting. Probably a goof vote. 10% of the vote went to the Hell in a Cell match. Only 10%. Pretty interesting. Hell in a Cell with Undertaker and Triple H only getting 10%. 13% went to Sheamus and Daniel Bryan. Ooh, how disappointed you must be, 13%. Now we get into the big hitters. 35% second place. 35%, and it was kind of close, but 35% went to Rock and Cena. 
35% for the match that sold WrestleMania, but number one with 39% went to Punk and Jericho. So let's see if uh, maybe some of you think that it turned out to be just that, because we're going to move on to WrestleMania 28, airing on April 1st this past Sunday from Miami, Florida. April 1st, 1990 was WrestleMania 6, the first pay-per-view I ever ordered with Hogan Warrior. And now, 22 years later, here we are with Punk, Jericho, Hell in a Cell, and Roxena, of course. First thing I wanted to mention was the set, because I thought it was really cool. Not if you were sitting in the obstructed view, but all the same, I thought if you're going to hold up the trusses like that in the lighting structure, putting the palm trees around it was really cool. Although, if they're going to do WrestleMania in New Jersey, it's not New York, it's fucking New Jersey. We're not a suburb of New York. Like, 90% of the ad was New York, New York, New York, New York. Fuck that. We're not even first on the goddamn logo. New Jersey, it's happening in New Jersey. What, we're not good enough as New York? We gotta leech off our neighbor for, uh, just, it annoys me as a New Jersey guy. But at any rate, if they're gonna do it next year in New Jersey, instead of palm trees, they could use the smokestacks in Newark. And I can't take credit for that. That was Shane Hagedorn's joke, so credit is given. Hope you're happy, Shane. So, anyway, opener was Daniel Bryan and Sheamus for the World Heavyweight title. Wow, where do we even begin? This is very, very interesting. So much so, I'm not even going to speak about it first. I'm going to throw it to you guys. So, Will Vafides? I'm going to be the one that's going to look into the negative into a positive in this. So, yes, it was pretty damn bad to open a show with an 18-second match. I totally agree with it. However, wait, 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 wait. I'll, I'll let you finish, but is it because it's an 18-second match at all or an 18-second title match? 18-second world title match. Okay. Title match, more so. I don't care about an 18-second match like if it was a Diva match. I would not have cared. I think we all would have forgotten about it. But then the crowd, Daniel Bryan's been acting like this coward hero for the last couple months. What better way to make him lose his belt than to lose it that quickly, especially when the guy was over in Miami. People brought thousands of yes sides. They never brought it to my attention really till that night. And then the crowd went nuts and couldn't believe that happened. And I thought it was one of the funniest things I've ever watched. It was with Jay Leto. And he was so pissed. And I was laughing so hard at that because I knew there had to be a good thing coming out of it. And I guess we found out the next night on Raw how why that was good, actually a good thing. So there is good into the bad. You think that was their intention, though? No Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Because the way he was a cowardly heel this entire time. You really think they cool. squashed him like that to turn him face? No, 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 no. I don't think they're turning him face. I think what they're doing is they got the crowd to react to it. Because honestly, I'll say. <laughs> do you really think that the next day we would be talking about Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus if it was actually a 10-minute match? No, we would not. If it was good, good, why not? I don't think it was going to be as good as some of the other matches on the show. I can tell you that. I don't mind the way they did it. Again, yes, that's a downfall. It's a big 18 seconds is ridiculous. But I thought it was super funny. And I think that, if anything, this is going to get Daniel Bryan over more as a human warfare. Well, it did, clearly. Yeah, it, it clearly worked. So, but just, but only, uh, no, no, no. It worked makes it seem like that was their intention. But I don't think right. it did get him over, but I don't think that was the intention here, in, at right. least to the degree that it has. The only downfall to this is that it makes Seamus look bad because now the crowd is going to boo him, and they're trying to push him as one of the faces of SmackDown. So this is the only downfall of this whole thing is that it really wasn't Seamus' fault. That's what sucks, and I think the fans shouldn't react the way like that to him. It should be more like do the yes chant, which I think is going to be in every arena now. It's replacing the what? I think it already it's has. I mean, they were chanting yeah. it at the ROH 10th anniversary show. Well, I and that was there. before I mean, WrestleMania. But, but now, but, now, but look at that. But the next night of Raw, you felt it, and even the rest of the night at uh, WrestleMania, you felt it. It put an impact on the show. There was a good into the bad. Well, I have to congratulate you, man. With Corey gone, you're finally taking the mantle of dumbass who speaks first and thinks later. Congrats for fucking relations. There's no way they could have predicted that that was going to, like, how the crowd was going to react and that was going to make them put them over and the yes chance would take over the what chance. There's no way they could have thought of that. And to do that made no sense. Like, no, we all knew Daniel Bryan was going to lose. 
We all know he's going to lose. It's fine. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But look at Mr. Mads. He's, he's the best wrestler in the world. Let him do what he does best. Wrestle. By doing this, he just all he did was alienate, again, he alienated Sheamus. And like you said, losing a face on SmackDown when they desperately need some. And, but the, but, and making, like, Dana Bryan look awesome when the whole time he's looking nothing but like a chicken shit heel, which is what he's been doing phenomenal at. So in my retrospect, it has the reverse effect of what they want. Hopefully they're smart enough to realize what they did and run with it. Let's, let's hope they're smart enough to realize that. I really do because, I mean, I was loving those yes chants all along. I thought it was great. And all the people who were chanting Daniel Bryan during the next two matches just wanted to show these people just fucked up. This has only been two days, but it's been the most interesting two days. Forget armchair booker. I'm talking armchair psychologist. <laughs> this has been the most interesting two days from that point of view with these two guys in a long time for me in wrestling. Firstly, I laughed my ass off too. Not because I was into it from a storyline point of view, but because I thought it was so absurd that they actually did that. <laughs> It was so wrong that they actually did that. I laughed at the absurdity of it. Because on his way to the ring, I was very happy. I was so happy to see Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan, whatever you want to call him. I'll call him Brian Danielson because, to me, he's one of the best wrestlers that I've ever worked with, one of the nicest guys. And when he was coming out to 80,000-whatever people chanting, yes, 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 and he was so over... I was genuinely happy for him because I wouldn't say he's necessarily a friend, but we've hung out, we've worked together. I'd say he's a buddy of mine. So I was very happy to see that because he, he deserves all that he gets. A lot of people in the past couple of years are getting their first fucking taste at seeing him, but Ring of Honor fans and indie fans who have known him for years have known how much talent this guy has and how over he could get if just given the chance. I said on Facebook today that it got a lot of likes, but especially seeing the yes, yes, yes in between commercial breaks video with him doing that promo with AJ for a minute and then getting her out of the ring and just seeing all that, I said, if you ever thought Daniel Bryan was boring and could never get over, eat my fucking shit. And I hate to be so like that about it, but he's kind of a buddy of mine, so I took it a little to heart. And I've let people rip on him all the time, all they want, and they can have their opinion and that's fine, but I think everything that's happened in the past two days has been kind of justification for him. Because, first of all, people were pissed. Doesn't mean they're not going to spend the money on WWE at all anymore, or whatever, but whatever. People will complain after they buy their tickets. So, regardless, people were pissed because that was a match they were looking forward to. Not even so much in the sense that, oh, they bumped it from the show last year and we didn't get to see it, and now they finally get to go on and they only gave them 18 seconds. It was bullshit. I think that's kind of why they were pissed and why it's turned Danielson into kind of a cult hero in a way, and Sheamus is getting the brunt of it. And it does kind of suck, like Will Vafides was alluding to, that people were reacting to Sheamus like this, but... I understand it because how else are they going to react in the way wrestling fans do? They're not going to stop buying tickets. If McMahon comes out, it's more of a storyline character sort of way, so it's not like they're going to be booing him because of the booking or whatever. So it just so happens that Sheamus was on the other side of it, and he's getting the brunt of it. So I feel bad for Sheamus in the way like that. But I was in a chat room during WrestleMania, and... We actually, all night long, everybody kept making the same joke that no matter what happened, like, it would be like, uh, fucking Divas match, more airtime than Daniel Bryan. Like, uh, yeah. from the source of mother, more airtime than Daniel Bryan. Like, we were making that joke all fucking night long. And it was, it was funny and sad at the same time. Okay, well, the story supposedly is that they wanted to make it so short to set a record of shortest title match at WrestleMania history, which they didn't. And also lost in the mix in this is the fact that Sheamus has now won both sets of world titles. But if they were going to do that, and that's a fine intention, I guess, but if they wanted to do that, why this match? Why not Cody Big Show? It could be just as easy 
as the bell rings, Cody runs into a knockout punch, one, two, three, bingo. Do you know how much they would have accomplished in that one fucking switch if they had just put Cody Big Show first? Not only does Cody lose the belt and Big Show wins the belt, he's never won, he gets his WrestleMania moment, right? But he also sets like a million fucking records at once. Shortest opening match in WrestleMania history, shortest title match in WrestleMania history. He wins the triple crown of the WWF and WCW. He wins all active titles in WWF. He's like, I could have made history in four seconds or eight seconds, whatever they were going for. They could have accomplished so much if they had just done it with Big Show and Cody instead. Then again, we wouldn't be where we are now with this yes, yes stuff going into even higher extremes. Moving on, the next match was Kane and Randy Orton. I see a lot of people saying online that the crowd was dead for this. I remember them reacting, and actually at the time I remember thinking that, wow, these people are really into the show if they're reacting to this shit. And it wasn't a bad match, but nothing special. And I actually felt pretty bad for Randy Orton at the end. Like, I think he kind of needed to win a little more than Kane. I mean, what's really Kane going to benefit from this? And I don't even like Orton, but it just seemed like Orton, isn't he one of their guys? Like, he should be doing a little better than this. The ending was just kind of weird, so... Or the the decision, I should say. So, anyway, Kane wins by pinfall after a second rope choke slam. And your thoughts, Will Alvarez? It was pretty good. It was decent. It did what it had to do. I did like Kane going over, and the reason why is because Kane doesn't really get to go over in singles matches if you really look back. I don't think he's designed to. And this is a company guy who's been there a lot longer, who may be getting to the end of his run. This could be like the last time we see this Kane run. I don't think it hurts anybody because this is not over. So I think there's more to I'll it. Say. But just what, well, the main thing was there wasn't enough build to the match. That That's the only thing I would say that was the downfall, why people didn't think this much. It always gets that thing when people say the crowd was dead. Like, what do people expect the, people, the crowd to be like? going nuts from, from the opening bell to, to the last bell. I mean, I don't get it. If you, people are reacting to moves, that's what you want them to do. And, it, yeah, towards the end of the match, you would kind of want people to be more and more active. But to say that they're not into a match just because they're not screaming their ass off, it's not, it doesn't mean they're not into the match. I, I really don't see the logic behind when people say that shit. And people were saying it at shows I was at and said the crowd was dead. Like, no, we weren't. I was there. <laughs> Uh, right. I mean, the match was fine. Yeah, there was nothing like too, too special, but I wasn't expecting anything special with that match. And you said Orton needs to win a bit more. I doubt it. Uh, I think Orton's fine. They also took a quote unquote super choke slam to beat him, which I think is pretty cool. So, other than that, I don't think he loses anything by losing the match. They want to keep Kane kind of in the main event heel role, so that's the one way to do it. The next part was actually the saddest part of WrestleMania to me the segment with Mick Foley and the Deadliest Catch guy. When they panned over to Mick Foley, I was just like, ugh, this is what he's reduced to? He looked old, he looked haggard, and this is his use for WrestleMania, doing some stupid fucking plug for some reality show with Santino. I just, I was saddened by it, actually. <laughs> but uh, the next segment was Big Show and Cody Rhodes for the Intercontinental title. About a five-minute match, short match, not bad, but like I said... In retrospect, I really think they could have done something special in the opener with it. But either way, I was very happy for Big Show. I thought he deserved it. And even though I'm not really in favor, in most cases anyway, of the established guy going over the younger guy, in this case, with the build, I think they put so much sympathy on the Big Show. And he was long overdue if you're talking about company guys. So for him to get the last piece of the puzzle as far as all his title lineage for the Intercontinental title and adding that to his collection. He's actually very decorated if you look back at his title history, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to detail that on the message board or something. But I was very happy for Big Show, so good thing here. So what do you guys think, Will Brooks? I thought it was good, Max. I think they're taking the belt off of it. They're just letting up, making sure that Cody's like all available to go to the main event slot, slot which is what I think they want to do with him. They want to put him in the main event, which is where he deserves to be. And if they, put, they put him in a feud with... Um, either I face Daniel Bryan or T.M. Punk as a championship role, that'd be amazing. I'd love to see those matches with Punk and Cody Rhodes. The only thing I don't like about it is the, it kind of seems like a step down for Big Show. Like, he was just fighting for the title, like, two months ago. It seems like it's like a step down for him to be the IC champion. But I like the Big Show. I've always have. 
And, yeah, it's nice for him to get a nice moment at WrestleMania, so good for him. Yeah, it was built up for him to win that match after all the torture, all those embarrassing moments that he really has done for WWE. This was a, I thought it was great. He was crying. He was emotional. He, like, he went to his wife. So it, it does mean a lot to him, and I think the crowd understood that and were behind him. And I thought it actually was a really good match. Cody Rhodes really has developed over the last couple of years. I think he gave Big Show his moment, his big moment this year. Going forward, the Intercontinental title has now finally got some mean. This is the first time it's defended in, what, four years in a real wrestling match? So the last time was JBL Rey Mysterio. That really wasn't a match. That was the um, Daniel Bryan Sheamus of that year. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, but but <laughs> And people like that, too. People actually like that part. It's JBL well, I don't want to see JBL for longer than, like, a few seconds anyway. Well... But uh, I think ever since, like, WrestleMania 18 was, like, the last time there was, like, a real intercontinental title match. So I think it's great. They put some emphasis on the belt. A lot of people I was watching it with, anyway, were hating on the next match, and I wasn't one of them. But it was the Divas Tag with Kelly Kelly and Maria Menounos, the celebrity this year, competing against the Divas champion Beth Phoenix and Eve Torres. Now, the reason I didn't have a problem with it is because... We're long past the time where WWE gives a fuck about putting on a decent Divas match at WrestleMania. I understand the intention here. Get fucking coverage on Entertainment Tonight and TMZ and all that other stuff. So I'm cool with it. All I want to do is look at fucking Maria Menounos' hot fucking stomach and belly button piercing an ass. (laughs) And that's all I've cared about. I mean, ooh, people were impressed by Kelly Kelly doing a fucking flip off the top rope, yippee skippy. The match was there. I don't think it was even that bad. All things considered, yeah, I thought it was fine. So, what do you guys think on um, the Divas tag, Will Brooks? Just like Cole, uh, Michael Cole and Jerry Law last year, just wait. It's just too long. Get it in, get it out. Okay, cool. Bye. <laughs> Don't drag it on. You, like, especially when Kelly Kelly is supposed to be the one carrying the the face of that team. <laughs> Kelly Kelly can't wrestle way out of a wet paper bag. What the fuck? And they put it with a woman who has broken ribs. What the hell is wrong with you people? I cannot confirm this, but I some guys in the chat room were telling me, and I didn't see this, that they think Maria Maria shit her pants. No. She was so white and she had brown stains in the back. I didn't see it. I'm saying that's what people told me. I didn't she see did it. A, she did a stink face to one of the fucking broads, and her makeup got on her ass. So how do people turn so. that into she shit her pants? So. I don't get it. She's not I Sid. So. And I don't believe Sid did it at WrestleMania 13 either. I bet he did. I and don't think so. I'm going to take this punch in your face. I might shit my face. Okay? <laughs> the match did what it was supposed to do. Just like it was like last year with the women's or the divas. It was the same idea. I don't understand the stain thing. That was just stupid that that actually happened. I mean, come on. I mean, that was just like the dumbest thing where ever started that rumor. The girl was hurt. I mean, look at it like that. She did, she did go out there and perform. The show must like, go on. She She did what Triple H would do when he tears his quad. She wrestled hurt. Yeah, well, I mean, if she was indeed hurt, God bless her for going out there and still performing. She could have easily been one of those people saying, "I can't wrestle or, or not be not not even be in the match." You, you know, know, Dancing with the Stars. Don't try this at home. <laughs> right, exactly. Right in the middle, kind of like Savage Flair was at WrestleMania Eight. Right in the middle was the Hell in a Cell match. Really says that you're fucking respected if you get fireworks in pyro for winning your mid card match, but. <laughs> Undertaker and Triple H rematch from last year, which was a rematch from 17. That never happened, apparently. And this year, Shawn Michaels is the ref. Now, they put Hell in a Cell into the mix to sell some pay-per-views, and I'm pretty sure that they sold a lot based on that, because as soon as they said Hell in a Cell, people marked out, Yay! And they even gave it its own entrance with Metallica, The Memory Remains, which was cute when they stare down after... We see that Undertaker is actually Chuck Liddell, who got stretched out. (laughs) He had the same mohawk and beer gut. But they stare up, and then the cell comes down with the music and the strobes. Cool. But, and this is not to take away from the match, because I think it was a fine match. If you took the Hell in a Cell out of the equation altogether, I think you'd have the exact same match. It really didn't come into play at all. I mean, I guess visually it looked good but it really didn't affect the structure or story of the match at all. That being said, the story was pretty good. I think it's pretty much the same match as last year, and I enjoyed last year's. I know a lot of people didn't. A lot of people said that it was better than last year's because there wasn't as much lying down or whatever. But I'd say from the spinebuster on the steps on, they had me. 
I like the drama. I think wrestling's at least WrestleMania gotten to like an indie level of everyone kicks out of everyone else's finishers. A lot of near falls. Shawn Michaels super kicking Triple H was not collusion with DX. It was Michaels getting retaliation for being put in Hell's Gate. I guess kind of unintentional consequences there. But all three of them sold the drama of the story, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. I don't think it's one of the greatest Hell in a Cells ever or anything like that. I don't think it's five stars, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Yeah, this was the match of the night. It was amazing to see The Undertaker in that new outfit. He looked like Shredder, and I even I even tweeted about that. I think that he looked like Ganondorf. But boy, yeah, the crowd went nuts when they saw him without the hair. It just showed that they approved of his look, like a new Undertaker in a way. You could tell like it was different from last year where Taker was on the ground more, and this year was more like Triple H was on the ground more. The match was great. It was a great storyteller. I do agree about the Hell in a Cell not really being really used, but they did use it for some spots. But the idea was that all three of these guys have Hell in a Cell history. All three of them have all history with each other, and it just was a great story to tell. I mean, of all the matches of the night, everyone who I was watching it with really were paying attention and really focusing on that match. It was just a great story. If it is like the last time... They're all going to wrestle, or it probably won't, but you know, it's the last time that at least Triple H is just going to wrestle or Undertaker. They went out on a high note, and I think the crowd was very happy. with No one has really said anything bad about it. I'm like one of the biggest Triple H haters on the planet, and I actually revel in that idea. But I have to admit, this was by far, I mean, I should say by far, but it was the best match on the card, easily. And it entertained me from the very beginning. I loved all the drama of Triple H just beating the shit out of him with that chair and with all the welts on the Undertaker's back. And so I was like, no, oh, don't do it anymore. Just stop it. Stop it. I loved that Undertaker. I really did. I know some people were like, it's too much talking. I loved it. I loved everything. And now you know what? I can see what you're saying. After the first five minutes of then waking, he saw his face on the cage. It really wasn't a factor at all. And I'll agree with you on that one. But I just loved the entire match. And I thought it was head and shoulders better than last year's match. Head and shoulders, man. Yeah, I would agree with that, too. I thought last year's match was okay. I don't know what everybody saw, and I still kind of don't. But this match, I thought it was way fucking better. And I thought Taker was done when he got super kicked and pedigreed. I was like, you should have seen how much I was jumping up. Like, no, like, no, no. It was awful. And <laughs> my roommate was rooting for Triple H the whole time, so I was definitely getting some static between me and her. But I remember saying, if Triple H would have ended the streak, I never would have forgave the WWE. Thank God that, that did not occur, because I don't know what I would have done. I guess it seems the judges two against one yet again. Next up was the 10-man GM tag match, I guess. Team Johnny and Team Teddy Long. Too many names to even mention. I'm just happy any time I get to see Booker T. Oksana looked very hot. I like seeing Teddy Long dance, and that's about all I have to say about this match, at least until the finish. So let's see what you guys think, Will Brooks. It would have been better if it was an elimination match. That would have added a little bit more to it, but it was okay. I remember thinking the whole, after the match, um, until you got to the end, I am thinking, man, Zack Ryder hasn't done anything but a flip. What's going on here? And then at the end of the match, when he started really looking good, and then he got, and then, uh, of course, then Eve tossed him the match, and then... (laughs) And then Eve put him over by kicking him in the ball. I thought that was great. It made Ryder look like so much better. Like, yes, now Ryder's going to get even more sympathy. He will like him even more. I like this. Some people were like, oh, he got buried. He did not get buried. Sometimes losing is better you than sure? winning. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure about that. Sometimes losing is better than winning for, for some people's character. I and don't know if that's the case makes, here. It makes Ryder look better because he got, he got cause she kicked him the ball. He got, he got tricked. He got swerved by Eve. Okay, it was cool. Like, I liked it like that. It was great. And then we all knew Lone Nice was going to win. It, it made more sense for Lone Nice to win. He's a way better character right now. And it's always better to have a, 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 a bad guy in charge of uh, in a power role. If you have good guys in power roles, it's good for a short period of time. You need to have bad guys in power roles so the good guys have somebody to fight against and go and rebel against. It makes more sense for Lone Nice to win. And I'm glad Ryder was the focal point of the match. So, yes, I, and I'm a big Ryder fan. So, it's all, it was, for me, it was fine. Well, I think if it was elimination, people would have had more chance to shine individually instead of getting lost in the mix, because I feel that's what happened here. Um, Outside of the Dolph Ziggler sell on that monkey flip, which was like, whoa, that was pretty cool. 
I think uh, Zack Ryder looked like a real bitch at the end of this, and I don't mean in a sympathy, build heat sort of way, because I think he's had enough of that over the past couple months. But Will Fitzgibbs, what do you think? He did exactly what they're supposed to do. It's supposed to calm down all the hype from the Hell in a Cell and give it time to kind of digest. And now you have this match, which it was what it was. It, like I said, not everyone got their spots in. It really started to pick up once the, once the flip went over the top rope. Honestly, they could have done just a brawl the whole time, and they could have done, like, the flip spot and done all that stuff. I'm glad the Miz got the pinfall. He needed some steam. He got the pinfall victory. And as far as Zack Ryder goes, I agree with Will Brooks. I actually think that he gets more sympathy from Eve. But, again, he's got to start developing some hatred towards Eve or something like that because he's kind of – he is being like a little bitch in a way. But he needs to get a little bit more serious. And that's what I'm waiting for to, for him to come in. He's too goofy sometimes now. And he needs to be a little more serious, kind of like how he was kind of building himself up to get a U.S. title match. I kind of like that kind of writer. This one's like a little goofy. But, I mean, I love I love Eve, man. Whew, that woman knows how to control her men. <laughs> I will be there if she needs me. Greg DeMarco, is this you? It is me, yes. Yeah. Skype kind of booted me off and said I had to immediately download a new version. So I was like, through Skype, that's why I have a cell phone. Let me host my show with, with the old version of Skype, but wouldn't let me call you with the old version of Skype, apparently. So Okay, I was wondering if you were going to show up. <laughs> yeah, Oh, yeah, we, we, we got to call our call in at the very end of our show, and you know how the overrun goes. And so I to get rid of them as soon as we could, close up shop, and get in here on the wrestling round table. I knew I had a small window. I want to make sure I got in on it. Well, thanks for your input. That's going to do it for Wrestling Round. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I had to fuck with you, Greg, after uh, being on your show last week, although I, I did have fun. I did have fun. So thank you for calling in. Uh, we are going to go into overtime, so it's not going to end in 14 minutes. If you are on the phone listening to the show, you will be able to download it after the fact, regardless, no matter how long we go. But you don't want to wait for that. You want to hear it live as it happens. And right now we got 411 Mania's Greg DeMarco on, host of the Greg DeMarco Show. Hey, Greg. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, we did just, just finish up a taping of the Greg DeMarco Show, which you'll be able to hear at 411 or over at VOCNation.com. But had Eric on our show last week, did a great job. And, uh, and, and I know you guys have a set plan, but I just want to tell you all listening and you all on the roundtable as well. Eric Santa Maria has, has a gift of framing what he's going to say, and really just a gift for for getting his thoughts out there in such an eloquent way. Every, every thought he had was was off the cuff, and it had a, almost a set intro, and just really did an amazing job. I was thoroughly impressed. I was commenting on the back end with my co-host about about the way that you got your point across, and did so in a way that was so unique, so different, and it really just did a great job. So really appreciated that. Just appreciated you coming on, and of course appreciate the chance to come on here and 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 talk to maybe some new listeners, and also just some great wrestling fans and, and great wrestling minds in general. Wow, thanks a lot, Greg. That that really does mean a lot to me. Um, well, that's uh, the not truth. It's nothing. Not just saying it. It's definitely the truth. I don't I don't I don't blow smoke up people's ass or anything like that. I have no thanks. Uh, uh, I was a little it. thrown when you played the know your role and shut your mouth on me because <laughs> you uh, know what. That's an honor. That's an honor of my program. I've done it for my co-host. I've done it for the guy that runs Forward on Mania. I've even done it for for Buggy Nova. So, so don't don't feel bad at all. But you know what? And then, but you you were correcting me, and you were correcting me in a way that you were absolutely right. And I did acknowledge that after that. Well, I, I know you did, and I just felt kind of weird doing it because I was kind of waiting my time. Uh, but when you said that about uh, Derek Gordon, I was – well, first of all, I wanted to clarify, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a fan. That's what this oh, – yeah. that's what we all are. And that's kind of like on a recent show with Jenny Rose, I said right at the beginning because it's important for me because I know so many wrestlers and I've been backstage so many times where you hear them talk about the fans and not even necessarily a derogatory manner, although I've heard that too, just casually refer them as Marks. And I never really liked that because without them, there is no fucking business and industry and sport, whatever you want to call it. So I I wanted to be a little more respectful about just being fans because that's what we all are. That's what we all start off as. And I I don't want them to forget that. That's why, like, every time I have them on, I mention how long they've been fans versus in addition to how long they've been wrestling. Now, the only time I like to play the – well, what have you done card, or you've never been in a ring card, and I hate doing that because 
there's nothing wrong with having a different perspective and bringing another opinion to the table. The only time I do that is when they overstep their bounds and try and act like they know a lot more than they do. Well, how many mm-hmm. fucking rings have you set up? How many times have you right. run the ropes? How many live shows have you done? It's when they, like, well, this is how things are, and this is how it's being. I'm a guru, and I'm an expert. Fuck you. I've been in the business, <laughs> like, over seven years, and I would never call myself an expert. And no one should be, or call themselves a guru, especially these fucking nerds on webcams who have, like, not even been on the other side of the guardrail. Because oh, I know. you should and always... They beg me to promote their show. It's so funny, and I'm sure they do it to you, too. Well, not so much. Uh, I think uh, we've got a little more enclosed audience. <laughs> uh, but uh, at least they're dedicated and show up every time we do a show and do Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. But point being that I, I hate playing that card, but the point was when I brought that stuff up is that I do have a little more experience than just being a fan. So just wanted to clarify that perspective right off the top, and uh, that's when I got that rock sound bite. I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> and that's more, and that has nothing to do with what you said. It was just whenever somebody jumps in and says something and corrects me or whatever, I always play it. But the thing about my show is, and, and my column and whatever is I never have a problem admitting when I'm wrong or when I've made a mistake because I'm a human being and I don't, you know, I love to laugh at myself. But I'm the same way. I, I've been, in, it was in the business that, you know, from 2006 on, so a little bit less time. And I've put on shows and set up rings and, and even to the point where I played a figurehead and, and even, even took a bump. I had no training whatsoever and then still took a bump to put, put a wrestler over. And, and But I even know, you know, Derek Gordon did it for, for well over 10, 12 years. Um, and, and so that's why, why we went to him, and, and he was the, the financial guy behind it and everything else. But, yeah, no, it is a different perspective, but you're right. I'm still a fan to this day, and, and, and you know, you can probably count the, on, on one hand the wrestlers who have made it big in the business who didn't start off as a fan, and I do hate it when people forget what it was like to be a fan of the business. And I hear that term backstage, too, marks or, you know, shut the door, don't let the marks in, stuff like that. And it pisses yeah. me off, too. It pisses off some of the rest. Oh, don't tell me we lost you, Greg. No, no, I'm still here. Okay, it sounded like you got cut off there. No, um, sorry about that. <laughs> well, we were talking about WrestleMania. We're up to the last two matches, but do you have any thoughts on the whole card that played out before Punk and Jericho? You know, and I'm sure you guys have had offered an awesome perspective. I will say this, and something that we didn't even get a chance to talk about on my show. I was impressed with what they gave to the women's match and the time they gave to the women's match, and I'm sure they spent plenty of time rehearsing it and everything beforehand, but I thought that was going to be a two-minute filler match, and they actually went on there and went legitimate. And they gave Kane the win over Randy Orton, and they did the 18-second opener, and it was just, you could tell from the start it was going to be a different WrestleMania, and, and, and thoroughly enjoyed the card, and had no problems with the other card. And, and I'm probably in the minority, but, but at the end of the day, I was okay with, with the treatment of Daniel Bryan, and I think he's actually coming out better for it in the end with, with just how over he is and all the yes chants that Daniel Bryan chants throughout the show, and, and I think it it did more for his career than, than the other match would have. Well, we definitely had a lot to say about that, not to retread it. Um, but, <laughs> and you don't uh, have to. Uh, we talked about it on our show, too, and, <laughs> and I'm sure it was good stuff. Well, I think it shows a lot of confidence in CM Punk as a performer, for him to go on right before the main event in the title match and in such a big way, because there was a lot of rumor that that match was actually going to open the pay-per-view, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. But as it was, they had a pretty good match. And what we talked about Tuesday, I I didn't want to keep it, because it was your first time doing a panel, correct? It was. I don't do panels, and, and, and... And, and with good reason. And you're, you're kind of the pro at panels, and I was kind of the baby at the panel, that's for sure. Well, listening to everyone else talk, I, I kept thinking, oh, I want to make this point or I want to say that. And I'm used to, just because I can as the host, just interrupt and interject and mm-hmm. let it continue. But I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. But I remember when people were making the point about there's no point in having Jericho chase Punk. Like, if Punk retains, there's no point in continuing this feud. I really disagree with that because, firstly, I disagree with the whole notion of there's no money in keeping the belt because everyone's, oh, it's all in the chase, it's all in the chase. I love the chase, but you know what? I'm a wrestling fan, and I like winners. So after my guy wins the title, I want to see him keep it and have a good reign so I don't just abandon somebody once they've made it. 
that's just how I feel about it. And I think how a lot of people feel about it, because if that was the case, I know it's a completely different era without TV every week and everything, but Hogan, San Martino, those sort of guys wouldn't have had the belt as long as they did. Hell, if fucking Hogan was the champion now in 1984 and they ran wrestling like it is now, he'd be a 12, 13, 14, 25 time champion instead of six. And those later reigns didn't come till much later on either. But what I was getting at with uh, Jericho is there's no money in the chase. Hmm, I was thinking, well, uh, Batista in their first match beat Triple H at WrestleMania for the title, and Triple H still chased them for two more months, and it really did put Batista over with how Triple H was never able to beat him leading up to, I believe, a Hell in a Cell. So it's not without precedent, and I think that's the direction we're going in now, especially with the angle they did last night that people seem to like. So as it was, the match was pretty good, and I think it really put Punk over with keeping the title, making Jericho, with all those great transitions and uh, counters, tap out to the Anaconda device, and I guess he goes on to Extreme Rules next month as the champion in Chicago, not having to win the belt back. And I always like that, not hot-shotting the title. So, Will Brooks, what do you think of Jericho and Punk? I didn't mean, uh, careful with Lone Ice, like, oh, you lose match with uh, disqualification, you lose the title. But they didn't, really need to be, they didn't really need to add anything to the match. I mean, I thought the match was going to be great regardless of that. I actually really disagree added- with you there, because I thought the first portions where Jericho was taunting Punk to hit him with a chair and your sister and all that other stuff, playing mind games with him, I thought that was pretty good. I honestly don't think it really needed it. I mean, I, I knew we were going to see a great technical match. That's what, and it didn't really need, like, the added bonus. I mean, the, the storyline going into it was okay enough. I mean, they got no air time to ever really plug any of it, but I thought it was good enough, and I just wanted to see the match. You didn't have to add more stuff to it. It wasn't, it wasn't really necessary in my mind, but it didn't take away from anything, so it wasn't a big deal. As far as the match goes, it was a little slower than I would like, but it was still fucking great. I liked every second of it. I enjoyed because the guys are kind of like similar in their styles, and I liked it. I especially liked how Jericho did the Boston Crab to the Lion came into like Walt Jericho. He kept going back and forth between those two submissions, which I really liked. The counters out of it by Punk. I knew he was he was going to have to win by Anaconda Vice because I just knew once he kicked out of the go to sleep, he had to go with the Anaconda Vice. So I was really happy to see that be the finish of the fight. It's always, in my opinion, especially in mixed martial arts, it's always better when you, like, make a guy tap out. Because at that point, the guy's, like, giving up, like, okay, fuck you, you're better than me. Fine, 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 fine. He's conceded I mean, that you're better. Yeah, exactly. It's, you're pulling over the other guy, and I just think that was a great way for Jericho to do that, to lose the Anaconda fight, which it was perfectly done. Before I say anything, I just want to welcome Greg to the show. And as the winner of the first and only Battle of the Wills, it's an honor to have you. That's the first thing I just want <laughs> Thank to you. say. As far as the match goes, uh, I loved it. I thought it was a really good match. I thought Jericho taunting, how's your sister, and all that. I don't like DQ finishes, so that's why I'm kind of happy they threw the stipulation out there that it, there wasn't going to be a DQ finish. That's what it basically did for me. I knew it was going to be a clean victory, and it, it went off great. I do agree it was a little slow. People were like, well, this is going to be the Ricky Steamo versus Randy Savage. I always heard that like the last few weeks. I think it was way overhyped for that, but... It, it didn't do a Ricky Steamboat versus Savage, but it definitely put Punk over. I mean, Punk got the fireworks. And for someone who's a first-time watcher of the product in a long time, and I'm sure it's a lot of people, it made Punk look really good. So I think Punk, in the end, looked like a strong WWE champion walking out of it. Yeah, I have to agree. And I, I want to point something out, what you said at the beginning about Jericho and, and the chase, and, and Jericho having the chase. And, and what Jericho did on Raw on Monday – Proves your point 100%. I mean, he can definitely chase and then make a great feud out of it, and a feud that's going to put CM Punk over in the end. On to the match, I was kind of in the boat of people that didn't think that the DQ stip was needed, uh, but I do think it added to the early portion of the match, the story they told. It was kind of a thing that it didn't bother me, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have cared either way whether they did it or whether they didn't do it. I hate adding a stipulation at the last second, but it did add to to what Johnny Ace was doing, so I'm fine with that. match itself was great. It's it, 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 it tossed up between that and the Hell in a Cell match or match of the night. This was more my speed, so I'd probably go with the Punk versus Chris Jericho as my match of the night, but love the story they told. Love the finishers taken out, and was so glad to see them putting over the Anaconda device, especially hearing how much hell that move got when Punk first came into WWE and how it wasn't going to be taken seriously, and the fact that he got to win a match at WrestleMania with the Anaconda device. And then Chris Jericho tapping out like that in the semi-main event at WrestleMania is a big deal. And also, they put Punk over huge. I mean, his entrance, you know, they went to the wide shot of the arena, and you saw CM Punk in big letters. And to me, this was this solidified what we kind of already felt, and that CM Punk is, 
is a legitimate top player in WWE and is going to be up there for a long time. And when he made his entrance, I kind of at that point said, he's winning this because this is WrestleMania, the showcase of the Immortals, and we're now transitioning CM Punk to that elite group. All right, we are in overtime, and let's get to the main event because that was the match that got all the hype. The Rock's big return to WrestleMania against John Cena, saying on the Raw leading up to this WrestleMania that he wanted to be the only person to get a victory over Austin, Hogan, and Cena at WrestleMania, I thought added a level of importance to this match that was sorely needed after this year of Twittering and TMZ and YouTube videos and talking and singing in the past few weeks. I think Survivor Series is long forgotten at this point, and this match really needed that sort of importance. It also really put Cena over in the fact that, and they did this on the WrestleMania True Story Blu-ray too, that he is mentioned in the same breath as those two guys. I thought that was very important for him, especially given the ending. Now, a lot of us expected Rock to win because we've heard that they're going to continue this angle or feud and do some more matches with them. And if Cena won, I don't think they would have uh, gone in that route. Personally, if it was myself and we had Rock committed to these dates, I'd rather see him involved with somebody else. I'd rather Cena and Rock won and done, Cena wins. I think that was the right way to go. There's a reason why nobody talks about Rock Hogan, too. And there's been a lot of debate on our message board about whether Cena has the torch or not, really. Because on one hand, people were saying he needed this win to get past the torch. On the other, people are like, what are you fucking talking about? The guy's been the top guy for seven years now. He has the torch, and he's beaten everybody else. Well, there was that year when he did come back, I think in uh, 08, when he ended up losing to like everybody, which was seemingly the opposite. But like The Rock, it didn't seem to matter who he lost to. He still retained his heat. He still retained his credibility. My argument to the contrary, though, is that yes, Cena has been the guy a long time, had the WWE title more times than anybody, set that record, a billion-time world champion. But you know what? When Hogan fought Andre, he had been champion for a couple years, and he was still the underdog, and he was still the guy needing to get the torch passed. Hogan was well-established by the time he fought Andre, and that's still the case there. Same for Hogan Rock. Rock getting the torch passed, so to speak, at WrestleMania 18 10 years ago. He had been well-established at that point, and he still got the rub. What I And I thought the match was fine. A lot of people thought Rock was blown up, and it wasn't that good and kind of slow and whatever, but I really liked it. I love that he broke out the flying crossbody, <laughs> old Rocky Maivia style, and then Cena turned it around into the FU. The ending that they went with definitely sets up a rematch in the sense that it was Cena making the mistake of letting his guard down and goofing off, and he paid for it. But when they cut to that shot of Cena sitting in the aisle like a loser, I really didn't have a good feeling about that. Just because looking at the scope of WrestleMania, firstly, I'll say that I thought it was a pretty good show. It was a relief for me as a fan who hasn't been really into WWE for a long time. And especially listening back to WrestleMania last year and our review of it, I thought I was way too generous and very staying on the positive side because that show fucking sucked. I know Triple H uh, Undertaker was good and Punk Orton was good, but everything else was pretty much crap. This year was pretty good, and I was feeling such a sense of relief afterwards thinking, WrestleMania was good. I didn't feel like I wasted my time. It was a pretty good show. Not perfect. Everyone's like, oh, this is going to be the best thing since WrestleMania 17. I don't think it was on that level. I don't think it's going to be an all-time great WrestleMania, but it was pretty good, enjoyable, and I liked more than I didn't like, and what I didn't like didn't really kill the show for me. But that being said, every year it seems that they build up to WrestleMania. They're making it out like this is going to be the year. This is the end of an era. We're last of a dying breed, and we're going to usher in the new stars. Now, the only case it seems they did that was Punk especially with how it was placed on the card, going over the veteran Jericho. But aside from that, I think the message was pretty clear. When Rock comes back after being gone forever and beats Cena, Cena lost, Orton lost, Cody lost. So the big winners of WrestleMania this year, aside from Punk, I'll grant that, but the big winners this year were Rock, Undertaker, Big Show, and Kane. That doesn't scream new stars to me. 
And we know about Seamus Bryan. We've talked about that plenty. So I, I left with kind of an awkward feeling. That being said, I enjoyed the match. I thought it was fine. I did not feel the sense of electricity and excitement I did. I wasn't as into it, let's say, as Rock Hogan 10 years ago. I didn't feel quite that spark. But for what it was, I enjoyed it. Definitely was a lot slower than I thought. I thought there would be a lot more taunting back and forth between the guys. It did fall a little short of my expectation of the of the match. Obviously, Rock won, and I knew that was going to win. I think it really started picking up. They started hitting their finishers on each other. It started picking up a little bit. But do I feel like the Rock was gassed? It looked like he was, unless they were really trying to sell it. But I definitely thought that it could have been better. For my expectation, uh, I did like the spot where he did the high cross body. That was definitely really nice uh, to see that. I was hoping up. he was going to break out a drop kick too. Yeah, well, I thought the flying cross body that made more sense because Rocky Maivia. That's uh, I mean, you see so many pictures of him doing that. So it was Rocky you know? Maivia, and he could have done the shoulder breaker too. So Cena would have a hard time well, doing the FU also. If I had to remember the Rocky Maivia character, it was either the stupid things that he was wearing or the high cross body. So. <laughs> Uh, but I thought the match did what it had to do. I don't think they're going to have another match between the two of them. Really? Because, really, I don't think so. I just don't think that there's a reason. One and done, it. and Cena's the loser here. Yeah, I think it's one and done. I just don't see... But if, if Cena won, or if Cena turned heel, then I could see the reason why. But right now, I don't see a reason why. Rock clearly stated he's going through a different route. And obviously, at the end of the Raw, we now know another route that Cena's going. So right now, I don't see that happening. But I thought that for the ending of the show, the overall the entrances and the year build-up to this match, I like the journey of it more so than the match. I think the journey of the entire build-up for this match was excellent. The one-hour documentary was really great. Told a lot of stories about these two people. It was really overall good, and I think I give both men credit for doing a great job. Even though I, it felt a little short of my expectation, I still think that it was still a really good match, and it was the biggest match in a long time in WrestleMania history, I would say. Well, no doubt about that, but I think The Rock coming out the next night and saying that he wants to win the title again kind of uh, brings up the fact that they were hinting at that last year and dropped that really quick. So maybe it's not over. We'll see. But, Will Brooks, your thoughts on the match? I like the match a lot. I mean, uh, I thought Rock was a little sloppy, but that's to be expected for a guy who's wrestled once in seven years. Overall, I liked it. I actually liked the spot where um, he did a high-cost body, not just because it was Rock and my view all over again, and, but, the, but I liked the hot fact that Cena rolled in it and caught him and then, like, picked him up. I mean, totally wrong. Brock did a whole lot better job when he did it. It was way more cool, but... Cena did it, doing it with, didn't bother me at all. It was really, I liked it. And actually, you knew at one point in the match, Cena was going to do a fucking people's elbow. Just like I thought The Rock was going to do a five knuckle shuffle at least at one point in the match. So when Cena was doing it, I was thinking, okay, all right, Cena, do something. I like this. And of course, when he got caught with The Rock bottom and he went down, I was thinking, okay, he's going to kick out. And he didn't kick out. I'm like, oh, shit, that's how they ended it. I mean, I liked the ending. It just was a little shocking. I thought they were going to be thrown up a little bit more. I was but real surprised, I, too, when it happened, and it was a three count. I was like, oh, really? Yeah, exactly. Not, not, nothing against the pinball. It's just one of those, oh, I thought you would have put it do something else for the ending. But that's cool. I mean, it didn't, didn't bother me when I owed it. I was just shocked that they went with the guy who hasn't been with the company in seven years. They said the guy's going to be the next kind of law. Mm-hmm. Again, I had no complaints about the match. It was everything I thought it would be? Uh, for the most part. I mean, for a guy Rock, who's what, like? 45, 48 years old. I mean, he's in that range somewhere. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting him to come out there and light the world on fire. I thought it was a good match for what it was, and I was satisfied. And I was, but when we get to the Raw talk, I'll tell you why I was not satisfied with Cena. I think you're adding 10 years onto Rock's uh, age there. But uh, Greg DeMarco, what do you think about the main event of WrestleMania 28? Well, the match itself, I actually thoroughly enjoyed the match, and I hear people saying about the speed of the match and the pace, but the WWE main event style that we're talking about here at WrestleMania, go back and watch the past few main events outside of maybe Taker Michaels, and, and you're kind of seeing the same pace of a match and, and the kicking out of the finishers. I did, I, I was surprised by the finish, although when Cena jumped over the rock and hit the ropes for the last time for the people's elbow, I leaned over to the guy sitting next to me and said, uh, rock's going to jump off rock bottom, and it's over. Um, I did see the sloppiness from the rock a little bit in, in both rock bottoms that were hit. Um, it, it seen his legs in the wrong spot. I don't know if that's the rock's fault or John Cena's fault. I don't it know enough like, about the uh, If I may jump in there, it looked like rock's 
legs were kind of in the way of Cena getting his feet up okay. uh, on second viewing because at first I thought, ah, oh, Cena didn't help him there at all, but it looked like right. he was going to go for the standard bump and okay. Rock's legs were kind of in the way. On the yeah, first and, one, and, I'll, and I'll give and I'll give it to to, to, to Rock there. And he, 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 had, he has to have some rust. I mean, the guy has not been in the ring in who knows how long. And then Kurt Hawkins and Tiffy Biasi are only going to get you so far um, in your in your training. But uh, but the match itself, I thoroughly enjoyed. I think it was your normal wrestling match, and I'm probably going to catch some flack for this, but it benefited from the crowd much in the way that the first thing that came to mind was, was Samoa Joe versus Kenta Kobashi. It, it was a regular wrestling match that was a good wrestling match, but the crowd took it to a whole nother level. And, and you've got to realize that was a hot crowd in an open stadium with no roof, and, and that's how loud that crowd was. Yeah. And, and you think the reaction was better on Raw? Well, that's because it's an enclosed structure, and, and then the reaction would have been deafening if, if this was in a dome stadium. There's no uh, just, uh, it, top for the sound to echo off of. Exactly, exactly. It all just escapes out the top. But I enjoyed the match. I thought the atmosphere was great. I was even okay with the multiple songs that led to the ring entrances because that's WrestleMania, and I'm okay with it because it's WrestleMania. And it's because it, it reminded me of the Mayweather fight. Like That was kind of like almost uh-huh. a boxing thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's a big, big fight feel that they were going for. Um, and it set the stage, and it pulled the calm, you know, calm the crowd down and whatever. And, and but I enjoyed the match thoroughly. I was surprised by the finish because I really thought they were going to give it to John Cena. Um, but you know, I do think uh, I, I look at what they did on Raw, and I look at where you have The Rock coming out and saying he wants to be the WWE champion. And what I think we're going to have, if I can speculate just a little bit, I think Cena is going to want a rematch. And I think Rock's going to be like, I don't want to wrestle you. I want to go for the title. And I think that's going to lead John Cena down the quest for another WB championship because he knows that's how he can get himself back into the ring with the Rock. So I wasn't sold on the rematch taking place at WrestleMania 29, but I do think that's the way they're going, and I do think it's going to cause Cena to have to win the belt so that he can get another match with the Rock. But as far as WrestleMania, I was happy with the main event. Uh, I was happy with the overall show, and I thought it was a fitting end and, and, and had no problem with it in the end. If the finish was Cena going over, I imagined a beautiful counter from the Rock Bottom attempt into an STF that they could have done, but didn't quite get that at all. So it seems like pretty good WrestleMania. Uh, listening back to a lot of our old shows leading up to this, because we've been doing the show a few years now, I think we went back to WrestleMania 25 was our first review, and I was just like, man, did we pick a bad time to start reviewing these shows or what? Because a lot of them just meshed together to me, and we're looking for bright spots and didn't find more than negative ones, it seems, in the past few years. But I think that streak, if any streak's going to be ended, ended this past Sunday because it was a good WrestleMania, and I'm glad people enjoyed it for the most part. And I will get to some of your calls now before we move on to Raw. And I want to go, firstly, to Sean in Florida because you're in the state where the events happen. You're on the air right now with Wrestling Roundtable. Boots to asses. <laughs> Boots to asses, Eric. This was a great show. Better than last year's. I was at last year's as well, and it really sucked. I, I do agree with you on that. But oh, so, yeah, this, you were at WrestleMania this year? Yes. WrestleMania was really the show I wanted to go because for the Rock and Cena. But, mm-hmm. again, the overall show, I, again, was great. Despite the, at the beginning with the 18 seconds with Danielson and Sheamus, but it was fun. It was just fun back to me. My brother and I were chanting, no, 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 instead of yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. But, no. The match qualities were great, too. I enjoyed, I enjoyed most matches. The Divas match, I thought, was good. was pretty good. Pretty, it was pretty good. Um, Triple H and Undertaker, the good match, put up another good WrestleMania match. Afterwards, oof, I was, like, happy when Undertaker's streak was still alive. The, um, I'm surprised the matches, still at how many people thought that it was going to end because I said on Greg's show on Tuesday, not even to say that he did actually mention on the WrestleMania Blu-ray the true story that I already talked about, or at least referenced. I think Triple H even said on that very documentary that his streak should never end. Uh, Not that he is final say yet, (laughs) but I said on uh, Greg's show Tuesday, I really don't think Triple H would be stupid enough to do it. Because that is the most sacred thing that they have to them. I I don't see them blowing it on anybody that they don't feel a thousand percent about. Triple H does not need it, especially at this point in his career. I really don't see anybody else on the roster right now who 
would be the guy outside of Cena. I think Cena, and it's not to say that they would do Cena Undertaker next year, but I see Cena, and this is including Brock, because Brock's more of an attraction to me, kind of like Rock. Rock Undertaker next year would just be a waste. I think it would just be, we know Undertaker's not going to lose. If he didn't lose to fucking Triple H and Michaels, he's not going to lose to even more of a part-timer than they are. Cena is the only person, kind of like Orton was, kind of like Batista was to a degree. I think Cena's the only guy who, if he fought Undertaker, people would be legitimately being like, not in a Triple H sense, like, I can't believe he's going to maybe do it. I think Cena would be someone that they would actually think had a really good chance of beating Undertaker. Well, that's that's good. That's that's a good theory to say, but it's just... It was just the factor of which Shawn Michaels and Triple H, you know, the fact that they've got DX <laughs> in the ring. Just I think that's even more reason that, not to, because they wouldn't uh, end it on a fucking screw job. No. No, I didn't think they wouldn't do that. It just helped It just helped build the match. It just helped sure, build sure. the whole build the match. Then that's why, you know, I was like, you know, I was breathing constantly, because I hadn't been this excited at, 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 a show, at a show in a while. So this really helped out. But again, really... and. One other thing, Jer- I, do, I did really enjoy Jericho and Punk. That match was great. But what's funny about that match, I want to say, is when I was where I was sitting, I was looking at the right side, and there was like a crowd of people just looking because I thought maybe Brock Lesnar was coming in or something. Uh-huh. But instead, it was a guy getting arrested <laughs> at the show. Yes, really. And, and then it's like, this is more important than the match. But no, the match I still love too. But really, the main factor, again, John Cena and Rock, I thought they really did put up a good match, really worked the build up. Even though yes, it was slow, they were doing the still technical, you know, the technical kind of wrestling, uh, you know, grapple and twi- arm twists and then I'll throw you over, and then over the rope and under on top of me stuff like that. But after a while I started to really get build up well until the I mean I said I did enjoy the ending though. I was I was really excited when the Rock won. Yes, I'm a Rocky fan. I was really happy the Rock won every just the people right behind me, the people I was next to, would have the Rock one is high fiving them. I was, I was right at the end of the show. I was always going up to fans of the Rock, of fans who were people who were fans of Rock's wearing the boots to ass shirt. I was always like boots to asses, boots to asses. Did anybody else um, feel like uh, Pat Patterson wrote that match with the beginning? <laughs> it felt like I was watching Hogan Warrior. Well, you know what's funny though, when Cena was doing, when Cena was trying to mock the Rock, doing the people, doing the people's own Rock counter with a Rock bottom, it just reminded me when Vince did the exact same thing uh, at King of the Ring 2000. This was a great show. Maybe it's not. Maybe it won't be. Maybe the best. Maybe it won't be the best show of the year, or at least, at least maybe it won't top WrestleMania 17 or any uh, or any other great WrestleMania. But it's it's on top of there. It was still a great show. I was happy to be a part of it. I was happy to see the year build up Rock and Cena match. Um, I was just leave, leaving the building. It was me. It was me, my brother, and my father. We left the building happy afterwards. Great show. I was ha- I was just happy to be a part of it. I'm happy you enjoyed your time there and shared it with us. Thank you, Sean in Florida. Abe and Augusta Jojo, you're back on. The first okay. review you did, I'm sorry, was 24. I think you're going to the um, archives on um, iTunes for the roundtable. You can find 24 review you did a couple years ago. Well. Thanks for correcting me. I don't even know what the fuck we did on our own show. <laughs> been hey, it's been a long time. Shows. <laughs> it's been a long time. Four years ago, so don't worry about it. I can't do but math I, either, as you can clearly see. So. God damn. But um, I saw a live too on um, pay per view. So the Rock team, I thought it was really good. I knew it was gonna be a five star technical classic and all that stuff. I thought Jericho and Punk was that kind of match where it felt very good. I liked the. Last five minutes where it's very good transitions, counters, all that kind of stuff. I think it was the best first made since 24. And when they had the hell in the South surprised how it was meant with during the card, but it made sense now how it ended up being. The AB title was second last. They wound up getting 30 minutes. That surprised me. It got almost 30 minutes. And well, a friend of mine. It's funny you said that because one thing that I felt good about this year was something I complained about last year was time, time. Management. management. This show did not leave me drained, did not make me bored. There was a good pace to it, and at the end of it, I was not falling asleep. So they did a good job with uh, timing most of their segments. Maybe not the opener, but uh, most of their segments this year. Yeah, that too. And I thought for the message was that if they don't do like 20-minute entrances, it should be a good WrestleMania. 
the only thing I didn't like, just me personally, because kind of racist what they did with the Brothers of Clay concert. They I forgot the from, Mamas. Yeah. Ugh, that made me so mad. And I'm black, by the way, so you know how I feel about that. Uh, no, I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it was so stereotypical. Bull. That's the only I did not like about WrestleMania. Like, really just couldn't stand. Other than that, I thought it was very good. I recommend if anyone wants to watch it over again with my DVD, I recommend getting it. Brodus Clay, it's funny you say that because during the show, I was like, they should have given Brodus Clay a match. Just give him, like, a minute-long squash, like, on Raw against Heath Slater or some shit, and then he comes out and does his mama thing. People are going to remember that, if nothing else. I'm just still kind of jealous that it's not the cat because I would have loved to have seen the cat dance with all his mamas. <laughs> that was him first. Justin in Eagle, Wisconsin. WrestleMania. I was kind of, kind of disappointed that Brian Sheamus was, like, really short. I mean, I, I didn't even get to see it. it. It, like, went by even before I could find an illegal feed to watch WrestleMania off of. It just kind of... And I think his fans are like not really upset that like WWE didn't really give these guys much thought, but that the match could have been really, really good, and they just kind of threw it away. That 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 irks at me a bit. Uh, the Mamas thing, I, I have to admit, I laughed at it because it was just so bad it was funny. Uh, but overall, I'd say that this that this was a a pretty solid WrestleMania. Not re- not really many moments to be disappointed about. And whatever moments I would have been disappointed about, I usually just took a piss break on. I did not catch your name last time. I'm sorry, but you're in South Carolina, so your name again, please. Well, from um, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I went to WrestleMania, and like the other people, besides the Brothers Clay thing, I thought it was a pretty good show. I felt it was um, it was pretty bad on WWE's part to give Brothers Clay so much time. And um, instead of giving that time to Sheamus and Bryan with that um, hardcore crowd, like, you don't, you don't really, you shouldn't really do that at WrestleMania. If you wanted to have a squash match between them, that they should have done that at a other pay per view with um, out so many um, hardcore fans there. Um, I haven't watched the the um, TV recording of it yet, and um, I was wondering how did it, how did the TV um, recording of it come across? Because um, the crowd there, it was. Um, it was really nice. It was the best crowd I ever went to. Like, I've been to two other ones before, 24 and 27, and 27 was pretty weak, and 24 with the people with um, coming from Flair, it was pretty strong. But the um, one on Sunday night, it was the best crowd I ever went to for um, for a pay-per-view. I don't understand anybody. Like, we talked about in the Kane Orton match saying that the crowd wasn't alive for a lot of it, because I thought they were hot all night, especially for the big matches, the Hell in a Cell, Rock Cena, Punk Jericho, etc. I mean, maybe I just wasn't paying attention a lot, because I certainly was. I was talking with Rodney and Lawrence and all that other sort of stuff, but it seemed like a good crowd all night to me. Aaron in Maryland, you were on. Okay, it should be quick on some of the worst promos, so going back to the previous topic. I want to chime in for the worst promos. Evan Courageous, WCW Mayhem 2000. My God, did that promo blue. Try to put on a fake accent, try to act all cool and everything. Man, my God, that promo blue. And I'll get for some of the best promos. Go real quick. Triple H's promo with JR on, I believe, before Fully Loaded or SummerSlam 1999. We're talking about, I am the fucking game. This goes all the way back to the clay, and I was held down for seven years and all that shit. I'm pretty sure that was before SummerSlam. Yes. Also, the Ric Flair, J.R. Ewing promo, the JBL promo for Grand American Bash 2004, where he got fired from uh, CNBC, and all that. And I could go on and on, but I wanted to, you know, save some time. As for Austin, my favorite match, like most people, Bret Hart, WrestleMania 13, favorite Austin, uh, well, favorite Austin moment. And, well, one for me that's kind of underrated was the promo that he cut on a Superstars to set up the Bret Hart match at Survivor Series, where it kind of told you all about the Austin character in that one promo, where it being an interview. And it says, you know, I like to issue one challenge to one certain Bret the Hitman Hart. And that promo right before in Survivor Series 2 with the black and white shading, Austin walking down the alleyway. It was pretty cool. 
At May overall, I thought it was great. Triple H, Undertaker, best match of the night. Paul Jericho, great. Roxanne was great. Pretty much everything was great. I I hated that uh, Sheamus won the title in 18 seconds, but, you know, that story. Raw was very good. I'm happy that Brock was back and everything. Lord Tenside debut, which, you know, was pretty cool because, you know, pretty much everybody in the arena knew it was Albert. And I think that one of the moments that people kind of keep kind of letting out before the Rock and Brock stuff was the CM Punk Mark Henry match because that was a damn great match. Even, even though it was more helped by the crowd, I think that was still a damn great match. I think it shows the effort that Mark Henry can put in. And it's not CM Punk did phenomenal, and that crowd really did help it. It's one of the best crowds you've ever seen for a Raw, and maybe like a Maybe like since probably the edge here, many people would say. So, anyways, uh, real the time by Eric, okay? Thank you, Aaron. And moving on to Raw, Will Brooks and Greg DeMarco. A lot of returns, as you mentioned before. Will Brooks, Abraham Washington, but the big ones, of course, A Train as Lord Tensei. Alberto Del Rio and Brock Lesnar. But going down uh, to some of the other ones. A train or Lord Tensei. It's funny how it looks like they dug out of Great Muda's closet for him. And back in my day, when we had a American pretending to be Japanese, they wore a mask. But I know he's not pretending to be Japanese. Actually, his theme music could have been "I'm Turning Japanese," but <laughs> yeah, I didn't really get into this little squash. It felt twice as long as what it actually was, and it seemed like the crowd didn't really care for it either. I do like Albert. I do like some of his stuff, but this just uh, kind of fell flat, especially when you consider how he's being brought back as the monster, right? Well, the fucking monster came back at the end of the night. People long forgot about that shit by the time that happened, but eh, maybe... There's some hope for it after all, and maybe it wasn't that bad to you guys. So what do you think, Will Brooks? Uh, any thoughts on Lord Tensei or Raw in general? I thought it was funny as hell when he came out looking like the Sultan. I didn't have a problem with the match. I think I thought it was funny, though, how Alex Riley still is still getting cheers. <laughs> like, you're like, Lord Tensei versus Alex Riley, and Alex Riley got cheers. I thought that was funny. The people still remember how he broke out from the Miz, and they just didn't do shit with him after that. Everybody was shitting on this match. I didn't have a problem with this match. I wasn't expecting anything but what I got, which is him going out there, doing some moves, beating the guy, and doing something Japanese-like, which I guess which was the spit in the hands or the claw, like Fritz von Eric look at that. So that doesn't really bother me that much. So I don't know. I thought it was fine. You know, it's funny. You know, when you bring up, they, they, they really countered his background from Japan. And everything about Japan, this guy goes to Japan. And I don't watch a ton of Japan stuff, but I don't remember A-Train pretending to be a ninja when he was in Japan. And and some of the poses he was using and everything, I'm like, it was almost like we went back to the early 90s or late 80s with Vince McMahon. And he was like, you got to return him into a ninja. Um, Completely stereotypical. Like, if he likes yeah. Japan so much, well, well, he, his fucking Titan Tron should be anime. <laughs> Right, and then bringing the guy who's Japanese, <laughs> if you really love Japan that much. But I love a, I love the talent, and I think he can do a lot of great things. And I'm sure they'll tweak it and get us to the point where he can. Uh, it, they saved it for me. I've been calling since since Cody Rhodes wasn't wearing knee pads. I've been calling for somebody to bring back the claw. And I wanted Cody to do it because I thought it would be hilarious to see him doing it. But when he busted out the claw at the end of the match and the effect of him spraying something out of his mouth with his hand, that to me has some promise. I, I love the claw. It just, it, it's, you know, I, I quote unquote mark out when I see the claw. And it's kind of an old school part of me. And so bringing the claw back made it okay. Do you think he has he's potential. Japanese or he's Texan? Well, I don't know if the claw is necessarily Texan, but I don't think he thinks he's Japanese. I think they think he's Japanese. But I think we'll see some tweaks to the character, as we do a lot of times. But you brought up a good point in the fact that it's really hard to debut a monster the same show where you're bringing back Brock Lesnar. And so I almost think it's kind of like Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus. In the grand scheme of things, no one's really going to remember what happened between Daniel Bryan and Sheamus. And I don't think people are going to remember that this was Lord Tensai's debut, all because of Brock Lesnar. All right, well, Brock Lesnar's debut was a big part of a lot of people saying this was the best Raw in a long time. Of course, Alberto Del Rio came back and started a program seemingly with Sheamus, but you were saying, well? See, because that's what people were cheering. They were cheering yes all night long, which is probably going to replace the what chance, but thank God, the what chance to overdo their welcome. 
But it was on the West End, and it was, when Alberta Rio came out, it was Gen C. C, C, which was really fucking fun. I think the height of, well, there were a couple moments of what that I enjoyed, but the height to me was the video package for the Royal Rumble 2002 when they took Kid Rock song Cocky and actually synced it up with what. I thought that was brilliant. It seems like WWE does their best work with Kid Rock music. Lonely Road of Faith and the beginning of, I believe it was the 10th anniversary Raw, Raw X, which was terrible, by the way, but they used Bob with the Daba at the beginning. That was awesome. But anyway, Brock Lesnar comes back. Wow. Great reaction, of course. We all know that. But what does it say about a guy that he hasn't even gotten in the ring yet? All he's done is walk out and walk around the aisle, and people are chanting, holy shit. (laughs) I think that means you're something special. (laughs) The other thing that I thought was interesting was Cena's response, I guess. They cut to Cena in the ring, and he's smirking. And I know a lot of people hate different aspects of John Cena and everything. First of all, I think this talk of turning heel, turning heel, especially after he lost at Rock, turning heel, give it the fuck up already. It's just not going to happen. To you, he already is a heel, so he doesn't need to change anything. But I just don't see that happening. Maybe I'll be wrong, and they'll try the fucking Hogan bash at the Beach 96 thing again because it worked so well with Austin in 2001. But I just don't see it happening. That being said... I could really see kind of what people were, like, annoyed with because they cut to Cena, and you'd think the reaction would be like, holy fuck, holy shit, what's he doing here? You know, the last time I was in the ring with him, it was F-U-F-5 back in Backlash 2003 or so. Uh, No, he has a smirk on his face? Like, yep. (laughs) It didn't settle well with me. And then, of course, people are like, what is Cena doing taking that extended hand that Brock's offering? What does he think he's going to do? Is he an idiot? At least he didn't do a kick to set it up. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, big return for Brock. Got lots of coverage. Of course, he's a big celebrity now from UFC. And I don't know if it's going to necessarily have the same effect that Brock did in UFC where he brought a lot of wrestling fans over. I don't see a lot of MMA fans coming over because of this, but that's not even the point. The point is, holy fuck. I think it kind of does hammer home, like I was alluding to, with who won at WrestleMania before, Kane, Undertaker, Big Show, The Rock. Well, now Brock's back. More bringing back big names from years past. Uh, I don't know what that says about the roster at this moment, but looks like he's going to be around uh, a lot more than Undertaker will be in the next year, if nothing else. And I guess they're going with him and Cena right off the bat. So we'll see how it goes. As it was big return that crowd was unbelievably jacked for Brock Lesnar coming back and it seems like it's uh, expanded online people were really excited about it so let's see what you guys think Greg DeMarco you're right about the crowd the crowd was amazing it, it was it's one of those perfect examples of the crowd wanted something and they got it. And so many times, they're, like during WrestleMania, imagine what the crowd was doing if Daniel Bryan showed up again later on the card after their chanting form during almost every undercard match. And they're going to the chanting, we want Lesnar. Cena even acknowledges it, which I was kind of surprised because at one point I was like, is, is Lesnar even going to show up tonight? And, and then when he comes out, yeah, it blew the roof off the place, a bigger pop than what The Rock got when he came out. And, and I kind of looked at it as Cena was clapping for Lesnar as if to say, okay, you're here, you you came, you got a reaction, you're coming to my ring. Like, to me, it more was, was seen as showing, okay, fine, whatever, we can share this. And, and and that's why I think he went for the handshake. I think he thought Lesnar was coming in as, like, I'm making my return, I'm not going to do anything. And so they were going to be buddy-buddy or whatever. And then, of course, Lesnar did the did, did the yeah, five on scene, which got the huge reaction from the crowd. Um I loved it. I mean, I loved having Brock Lesnar back. When he, when he did just, just so much as him doing his little dance up on the stage and the reaction that got out of the fans, which is really funny. Somebody brought this up on my show tonight. We hated him when he left eight years ago. People were booing him out of the building at Madison Square Garden. They were so pissed off that he was leaving in the way he left. And now it's like bringing him back with open arms. And it's so funny how, how we are as wrestling fans, myself included. But uh, I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see what he can do. Um, I will tell you this. We, we were lucky enough to get 
uh, a guy who writes for MMAinterviews.tv on our show tonight. He's been on before, and he's friends with one of our regular contributors, and, and came on out of, out of nowhere. They just happen to be hanging out together. And, and his sense from the MMA community is that they are watching this, and they are kind of coming on and seeing what Brock Lesnar can do in wrestling. And actually, we, he, he predicts, and he's kind of more the MMA guy, that it will actually bring some of the MMA audience into wrestling. I don't know if they'll stick around, but I think we are there's a little bit of spike from the MMA audience, and, uh, and we'll see. And, that, and then be, because of that, we might see a heavy MMA influence on Brock Lesnar's in-ring style, too. I think we'll end up seeing probably a little bit, at least experimentally, of that, regardless, because mm-hmm. everyone knows he was UFC champion. But if I was to right. guess MMA fans' reactions, because uh, this got a lot of play, I'm sure they're like, oh, he's back in WWE. I just feel like they, most of them, especially the diehards, never really accepted or wanted Brock anyway. And especially with the way he went out, I feel like they'll, they're more than likely, I would guess, to be like, good, that's where he belongs. We don't want him anymore. Right. And if I were to predict, I think it's going to be a short-term thing. I think the MMA fans are not going to stick around from this, unless for some crazy reason we see more MMA guys come to wrestling because of Brock's level of success, which that's a whole different conversation for another time. What they did last night, though, I was very happy with it. I enjoyed it. I got a kick out of it. And I'm excited to see what they do. Um, rumor had it, it's been reported that, that um, and this is pure speculation, I don't even remember which site reported, that, that the main event for Extreme Rules is going to be Punk versus Cena. And that's what's been advertised locally in Chicago, apparently. So obviously Lester's not wrestling just yet. Yeah, I saw that myself. And uh, being, I would guess, local advertising, I'm like, that doesn't seem to be where they're going, judging from last night at all. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. I was kind of surprised when I saw that, but supposedly it was put together last week. But, you know, it is in Chicago, and maybe they're trying to recapture whatever happened in Money in the Bank and sort of tip their hat to that. I don't know. I, we'll see what it, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Well, let's back up for a second and um, examine the promo that John Cena was giving before Brock Lesnar even came out. What a fucking bitch. I'm just like, dude, grow a dick. I tried my best and Mark was this and I was this. I'm like, no, dude. This is why we fucking hate you as, as people my age group because you don't stand up for yourself. You don't say, come back with adventures. You just kind of say, well, you know, shit happens. I'm like, no. When Austin lost, he came out the next night and said, you know what, I'm going to go back and kick your fucking ass. Rock did that. All the greats did that. She was not doing that. He just like, no, oh, well, you know, I lost, and yeah, you know, that's the way you like it. No, fucking go back and kick his ass. Do something. When Rock came out, he smirked. He was like, dude, oh my god, punch this guy in the face, please. Do something. And when he f fired him, I was like, thank God, I could stand it. Thank God he f fired him because f you, Cena. I mean, I try to respect you, man, and I was really, I really respect you, but same time, go with Dick. <laughs> But you, you still know, like Raw overall, though. I loved Raw. I thought it was one of the best Raws I've seen in a long time. Something that you said about Cena's promo, and I hated Cena's promo, too, and, and, I, and I agree with you. They'll never sort of turn John Cena heel as much as some of us want it. And I would love to see John Cena turn heel from the perspective of, I like Cena as a performer and think he could do very well with it. I think part of the problem with that promo last night is is the heel reaction would have made perfect sense, and it's not what, and they just didn't want to go that direction. And I don't think they knew what direction the two go in, so they said go out there and give the typical, you know, you lost a Super Bowl interview, and it was really just filler until Brock Lesnar came out in the F5. Seems like people really liked Raw, and I know one person who definitely liked Raw was Wu S. Kim, one of our fans out in California, but. He was not able to listen to the show tonight because he was in the hospital. He has a viral throat infection, and he really enjoyed watching Brock come back in the hospital. So get well, Wu, and hope to hear back from you soon. And thank you very much, Greg, for joining us tonight. And where can we hear all of your stuff? Is it all on 411 Mania? And the yeah, if you go to forwardonmedia.com and then you do a, a, a search for Greg DeMarco, it's the easiest way to find all the stuff that I have done. Every Friday night uh, around 11 p.m. Eastern time is when the Wrestling 5 and 1 comes out. Kind of the cornerstone column over there on the weekend and then a lot of play there. Uh, my, my, my show, the easiest way to find my show is to go on VOC Nation and look for podcasts. You'll see most of them. Uh, if you go to Blog Talk Radio for the ones before that, you'll see them as well. But we have a good time, and I always appreciate the other shows as well. And I always appreciate you having me on. It was a good time, and I definitely appreciate you doing it. And, uh, and yeah, anybody who wants anything or needs anything, look for me on Facebook, Twitter, as is Greg DeMarco Show. Facebook, just look for Greg DeMarco, and you'll find it. And, and we always have a good time. So, and I definitely do, again, appreciate you guys having me on. and love what you do here. Thank you, and you are welcome back anytime, Greg. So thank all of you 
for listening. I know it's late, but can I possibly get a few yes, yes, yeses? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you guys very much. We'll be yeah. back in three weeks. We're going to talk about UFC, WWE, anything else going on in the world of pro wrestling and MMA. So thank you for joining us on Overtime for the panel of Greg DeMarco, Will Brooks, Will Vafides. I'm Eric Santa Maria. Thank you to all the callers and join us on WrestlingRoundtable.com. <laughs>